Uh, now let's uh, welcome you all to our conference um, with the title A Stronger Europe in the World, Resilience Building in the EU's Eastern Neighbourhood Before and After the Russian War Against Ukraine. Now, the workshop, as you probably noticed, is organized under the umbrella of the Relay Jean Monnet Network. Um, this is based at Maastricht University Brussels campus and it's funded by the European Commission. Now, Relay um, examines the Commission priorities for 2019 to 2024, um, as no doubt uh, you will all know. Uh, there are also six priorities in total and among them is the priority um, that we are focusing focusing on in this part of the project, a stronger Europe uh, in the world. And here the EU pledges, and that was already back in uh, 2019, uh, to strengthen its voice in the world by championing multilateralism and a rules-based global order. Now, uh, clearly, since the priorities were drafted, uh, the task of championing uh, multilateralism and rules-based global order um, has not become uh, easier at all. In fact, it has become an even greater uh, challenge, uh, certainly as the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, not only uh, delays all uh, principles of liberal international world order, but also directly and most acutely uh, threatens uh, peace and security on the European continent, the EU security, and of course the security of the EU's eastern neighbours. Now, this conference today and its contributions are based on a workshop we already held back in 2019, if I remember correctly. Um, there we took stock of resilience building in the EU's uh, eastern neighbourhood after 10 years of eastern partnership policy. Uh, but of course, uh, again, um, four years later, uh, much has uh, changed and now we are about to publish the con contributions um, to that workshop as part of a, a special issue uh, with the Journal of Contemporary European Studies. Now, some of the articles of the contributions are already uh, online first available um, uh, to, to be read, uh, others will be published uh, very soon and uh, this is uh, together uh, with uh, Christian Kaunert and also Alena Viaira, um, we are uh, co-editing the special issues and we include their reflections on the impact also of Russia's invasion um, of Ukraine um, on the EU's resilience building uh, agenda, the Eastern Partnership and EU foreign policy more broadly. And of course, we are specifically interested four years ago and now even more uh, in the relationship and the potential tension or dilemma between the EU's pragmatic uh, geopolitical priorities and here ingrained also the resilience agenda on the one hand and of course the EU's pledge to uphold principles uh, such as human rights, uh, democracy and multilateralism on the other hand. Now that dilemma um, after uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, the geopolitization uh, of EU foreign policy is only likely uh, to become more relevant and urgent now and in the future. Now, and uh, with us today are most of the contributors to our special issue. Um, and as I already mentioned, uh, the three um, editors of the special issue. And in the morning session, um, the contributions will uh, cluster around the themes of EU resilience, crisis management and security. And in the afternoon, we're taking a step back and reflect uh, on the discourses or the many faces of EU uh, resilience uh, discourses and practices. And then um, this will be followed uh, by a final you know, concluding remarks by the conference organizers, including especially also in the context of the relay project, um, a, a set of policy recommendations that flow from our contributions uh, today. Unfortunately, um, and I will soon finish now, um, our last uh, speaker um, and special issue contributor, uh, Mihai Gorman, uh, he will not be able to join us this afternoon. Unfortunately, he is stuck at various airports today uh, because he also, also today wanted to reach Moldova from Germany. And of course, uh, there are uh, many strikes uh, today and including uh, uh, flight cancellations. So we will um, have to uh, miss uh, Mihai, uh, unfortunately, but nevertheless, uh, we still have a very uh, strong and interesting 
a cohort here of uh, contributors, which we are very much looking forward to. And last but not least, a note also on the supporting organizations um, and projects for this conferences. Uh, for this conference, we have the Jean Monnet Network, Relay, of course, and Maastricht University Brussels campus, who are in the lead um, uh, supporting this conference, but also um, the conference is supported um, by the Center for European Research in Maastricht, uh, CIRIM, the Research Center in Political Science at the University of Minho, uh, the EU Academy and the uh, Jean Monnet Euchter Network, and also uh, Professor Kaunertz and my own Jean Monnet uh, chairs. Now, and on that note, I'm looking at uh, Alena and Christian. Uh, would you want to add anything that I forgot uh, to mention on our conference today? I don't think you forgot anything. Let me just maybe also thank the European Commission for their support and maybe say two words uh, about the project. So uh, the EU CTER network is the Jomone network on EU counterterrorism. It's led by the University of South Wales. It also includes, of course, uh, Maastricht University and a number of other universities that are also present here. At our, at our current um, workshop. So thank you very much for mentioning that. It also um, includes our Jomoni Center of Excellence Virtue, which is to uh, produce virtual excellence in education and European studies, also based at the European, uh, at, at the University of South Wales. And finally, uh, the project EU Academy, which is based at Dublin City University, which has the objective to push forward in terms of teacher education and European studies in order to, in a sense, use education as a tool to reduce your skepticism, if you like, and, and, and to bring forward uh, European ideals more strongly, as well as my uh, Chair, EUCTIRL, at DCU as well, uh, which is again built on uh, counterterrorism. So I'll um, I'll shut up on this point. I just thank um, Giselle and Alena for the fantastic collaboration that we've had, as you said, since 2019. I think it's great um, that we're able to come together again and, and present the work. Once we presented it pre-publication, now we're uh, presenting it post-publication. I think this is a fantastic opportunity and I'm really looking forward to the day. So thank you very much for bringing everything together. And uh, I hand over maybe to Alina who wants to say two or three words as well. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome you today. Uh, very warm welcome to all the speakers and uh, all the attendants, all the audience. I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Giselle Bossa for incredible efforts that she has put into this particular event. A lot of uh, what we see and what we are going to hear today is due to her very intense efforts in the last weeks. So thank you very much, Giselle, for organizing this. And of course, to Professor Christian Kaunert and his uh, support to in every single phase of this conference. And of course, I would like to thank especially to the Brussels technical team, Campus Brussels technical team, who are here with us every single minute and making sure that we are being heard uh, properly. Thank you very much. And I hope you join, enjoy the event. Okay, and then without further ado, I suggest that we start uh, with our first uh, panel. Uh, we have three uh, very uh, interesting and also renowned uh, speakers and then very uh, gl glad and uh, thankful that they uh, managed to join us today, despite their undoubtedly uh, very busy agendas. Um, we uh, start off with the presentation by Dr. Michal Natorski, who is assistant professor here at Maastricht University at the uh, Maastricht University School of Governance and also you know Merit uh, here at Maastricht and he will present on resilience in EU crisis interventions in Ukraine, a complexity uh, perspective. And then uh, secondly, we have the presentation by Professor Christian Kaunert and uh, Dr. Joanna de Deus Pereira. Um, uh, from uh, both, uh, oh, sorry, from Christians from Dublin City University and the University of South Wales, and Joanna uh, from the University of South Wales, and they'll be presenting on the EU's Eastern Partnership on Ontological Security and EU Ukraine 
um, Russian warfare. And finally, uh, we're most delighted to welcome Dr. Kirsty Reich, uh, director of the Estonian uh, Foreign Policy Institute, uh, who will be uh, discussing her paper on enhancing integration and security through connectivity, the case of EU-Ukraine relations. And I suggest, uh, looking at the time, uh, we have about 15 to 20 minutes for each of our speakers, um, followed then um, at the very end by about half an hour of questions and answers uh, by the audience. So thank you so much again that you can uh, join us, um, Michal, Christian, Joanna and Kirsty. And Michal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giselle, for organizing the, 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 this event. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure. Thank you also, Kristen and Elena, for putting together this special issue. I have to admit that, admit that it was quite a right and journey because when we met first, it was 2019. I never suspected that I would have to uh, test resilience on myself during COVID and now during the war to observe what's going on. So it's, it's really a, a, a big uh, thing for me that we can uh, already uh, present the research that we've been doing under such special circumstances, in fact, um, during during these last uh, couple of years. But I, I also strongly believe that this is um, still relevant research for the for the future, and I think it's a lot of to, to contribute to the policy debate. So I'm so, super uh, very happy that uh, this event is also organized within this broader frameworks and networks that will inform maybe policy we're making of the European Union in view of the uh, of the war in Ukraine and also developments in the in the world. Um, okay, uh, thanks for the putting me in the spotlight as the first speaker. So I will try to um, uh, do this fifteen minutes uh, as 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 promised. Uh, so my research is on resilience in EU crisis interventions in Ukraine, complexity perspective. Um, it is believed, uh, and the topic of our special issue is about that resilience became a key development in the evolution of the EU foreign policy doctrines. But at the same time, we can easily observe that many of the classical diplomatic, strategic, security related practices are in place. So we have the, these two, the, two, two types of, of developments. Um, my question was a very easy question and many people in fact ask the same question to what extent the EU has embraced a genuine resilience approach uh, in the in the in its practices but the, my approach is maybe a little bit um, different from many of the approaches because I try to um, apply complexity thinking uh, complexity thinking is a, 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 I will present it a little bit more but uh, this is the, the assumption uh, from uh, from resilience uh, thing uh, uh, research that complexity thinking is a condition of the resilience approach this is my my assumption i will try to test it to what extent it's really uh, uh, the, the the fact and the idea that i try to apply in this paper is that um, there are two types of resilience in fact there is a be resilience as a quality of complex systems and resilience in thinking Resilience as a thinking about complex systems. So there are two different elements. One is descriptive, other is more practical. And this can be associated, in fact, to two different types of complexity thinking. One is called simple, other is general uh, uh, type of uh, complexity thinking. My empirical focus, as already announced, is about Ukraine. It's a what I ask and try to, try to analyze to what extent these complexity features uh, in the specific practices embedded in peace building interventions in Ukraine since 2014 until 2021 until the uh, Russian uh, war against Ukraine. Um, and I, I try to, to look at a specific set of, of uh, uh, interventions uh, related to peace building and to assess to what extent this complexity thinking can be associated to re resilience. And we know uh, from previous research already that resilience and conflicts are closely related. This is both in the academia, but also in the practices, uh, in the in the international organizations, uh, um, uh, guidelines of policies that uh, basically resilience is about the ability of individuals and community to cope with or adapt to violent conflicts in order to foster more sustainable peace. Similar uh, definition comes also from the research which applies already complexity thinking. It's the ability of social institutions to absorb and adapt to the shocks and setbacks they are likely to face. So it's about the adaptation, it's about the coping, it's about the reaction to, to conflicts. 
Um, and complexity, as I promised, I will uh, say a couple of words because this is maybe not very well known approach in the social sciences so far, but I think it's uh, gaining its ground. Complexity, it's a, it's a inspired by natural sciences, but it's adapted to social sciences. It's about the examination of and of the constitution and evolution of systems as self-organizing emergent phenomena evolving in a non-linear way. Just to picture what it is, a complex system, think about the flock of birds. I'm looking behind my, outside the window, the birds flying together uh, as, as a flock without uh, one authority, but they are co-organized and they create these beautiful images that they fly together in a, a very synchronous way. And this is precisely a complex system. They, there is no one leader. They are simply communicating between each other and they create these kind of systems in natural sciences. In social sciences, we can think about, uh, for example, how uh, connections and the transport networks are coordinated and coexist different small units of trains, cars, and buses, they are connected and they are somehow organ um, they work together without also so uh, one authority. So coming from uh, com coming from this the description, complex is a system which large, which large networks of components with no central control and simple rules of operation give rise to complex collective behavior, sophisticated information processing and adaptation via learning or evolution. And in research uh, about uh, complexity and also in, re in research about resilience, that there is a strong assumption that the complexity as such uh, is a condition for developing a resilience approach. So there is a, a lot of inspiration from complexity thinking in uh, practical approaches to resilience. And I study only two uh, features of complexity in my paper. One is about nonlinear causal processes. Usually we think about linearity in complex, it's a nonlinear. And it's about feedback loops, equifinality, and input input output imbalances, which are uh, not very easy maybe to to capture with the traditional approaches to the uh, uh, analysis of causality. But we can uh, look at them from from uh, a little bit more different um, methodologies. And the second element of complexity I try to look at my in my paper is about localization and self organization. This is more traditional approach to resilience thinking. Who, thinking how bottom-up uh, self-organization uh, without some strong uh, central control uh, allows to, to, to prepare for, for, for uh, coping with the uh, crisis and, and conflicts. So my focus, in fact, is on the projects, on projects management uh, practices in a specific uh, situation in Ukraine. But as project management as such, it exists as a very transversal approach to, to in the European Union governance system. Practices are simply routinized by high type of behavior, which consists of several interconnected elements. And projects are this kind of, uh, of, of uh, routinized pract uh, practices. They are patterned activities following very few heuristic devices like planning. All of us who uh, applied for general net network, how you know how it works, you have to prepare a budget, work program, uh, work program, uh, uh, etc. So all these type of plannings, it's one of the, uh, the uh, aspects of, of practices of project management. Then you have to implement reporting and and close with some 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 uh, nice conference or final report. This is typical approach to projects. And this is pattern activities we, we all of us, we adopt. Uh, at the same time, what is important in projects that all projects are somehow different because they have different purpose, for example, or different type of budget, etc. But nevertheless, what is important here, it's a mon managerial model of uh, international uh, relations, very, very extended, maybe not uh, very, uh, very researched but I try to fill a little bit in this gap. And my uh, focus is on um, looking at projects in the project in, uh, of uh, peace building interventions in Ukraine uh, in the in period 2014, uh, 2021. I look basically on documents. I look at documents framing your interventions or uh, pre preparation, preparatory documents that uh, set up the, the different projects uh, prepared and in, then later implemented in Ukraine during this period. And I, I do this research using a method of content analysis by coding the networks of first causal relations embedded in these um, interventions, and then looking also connecting different actors, which are 
put on the spotlight in these in these documents as beneficiaries in the implementers etc in in essence this is simply to recover what is called in the practices theory of change theory of change which is a kind of folk theory of how change happens it's not very scientific maybe with all epistemological ontological assumptions but this is how the world works that all of us we have some theories practitioners they have theories and they think that this implementation of this theory will bring out about some kind of change so I analyzed 29 interventions in 19 decisions with, uh, of the European Commission implementing what is called instrument contributing to st stability and peace which is a, a short-term uh, uh, instrument for to react to different types of crises and implement actions in order to uh, foster peace building uh, it's a very specific uh, uh, type of uh, also institutional embedness because it's somehow shared by the european commission to what uh, some extent with the uh, east e european external action service but it's basically uh, managed by by special services within the within the, co the commission and I looked at these two elements, resilience as thinking, resilience as quality. A resilience as thinking is simply to think about reflectively and adaptively uh, how self-governance at local and individual levels uh, uh, is, is promoted by the, by the practices of the European Union and whether this resilience as thinking informs the practices of interventions. So on the one hand, I look at little, a little bit of the discourse about resilience in general framing of European partnership of solar relations with Ukraine. I did not find too much uh, uh, explanation until 2021 that uh, resilience is was really driving the, the approach of the European Union towards Ukraine. Um, and also I could, in these general documents, I couldn't find too many references to, to resilience only uh, three commission decisions mention ex explicitly resilience in their titles and then two other only include some uh, references to resilience in general objectives uh, all during all this period which shows that this is not the key element of the uh, eu intervention in the in, in ukraine why does it happen i will look at uh, it's it's another story but maybe this is also related precisely to the practices how strongly they are embedded in the in the uh, processes in the European Commission. So in the European Commission, basically everything needs to go according to some practice, to some standardized uh, procedures. And one of the uh, very standardized procedures is how to design projects of this type in Ukraine, like in projects in the instrument contributing to stability and peace. And there is a special manual handbook to which guides all practitioners across the, the globe how to approach the preparation and implementation and closing of these projects. And this set of, uh, of, of tools of planning and uh, implementation, they do not allow to, for too much resilience informed by complexity thinking. Because on the one hand, we have a very clear top-down linearity thinking in project planning. There is a clear uh, idea of we want to have some kind of impact and we connect this impact with activities and we are assuming that all this will happen in linear way there is no too much scope for non-linearity feedback, feedback loops or uh, um, other types of, uh, uh, of non-linear causality and the same uh, happens when we think about planning of projects in terms of the involvement of stakeholders usually stakeholders especially local stakeholders are um, engaged as the source of information to plan from the headquarters and from the delegation in Kiev the, the, the project, but they are not involved as the real um, a part or counterpart in the in the project. And all this, of course, uh, limits very strongly the, the complexity in terms of the thinking because we have a very strong image that uh, there is outside uh, idea how uh, resilience should be uh, promoted or how how peace building in general should be promoted and then stakeholders for example are some, simply the source of information to verify initial assumptions coming from the headquarters and the other story comes with uh, the different stories when we think about uh, resilience as quality of what emerges from these nine 29 interventions Resilience as quality describes general features of entities such as systems, organizations, and agents. Uh, 
and the complexity features in the emerging network of connections and causalities between the aggregate elements of theories of change. I will not go into the detail of the method, but the issue is that all my uh, uh, projects that I analyzed, uh, I tried to uh, try analyze uh, different features in order to connect between between them and try to uh, to uh, verify whether all projects are, for example, uh, implemented separately or there is some kind of connection between them. And then we can think about broader picture, not individual projects, but a system of, of projects or, or interventions. So I, I codified the different elements of documents that I studied, for example, post crisis needs or crisis needs, in fact, at the local and state levels, what kind of capacities or means the European Commission imagined is necessary in order to bring about some expected results, and what actors are involved in this, in this issue uh, uh, or should be involved in these uh, interventions. So what we can uh, observe, uh, first of all, looking at the localization of actors network, that there is a connection, very strong connection between, in fact, state and local, elements state institutions uh, uh, trying in fact to to somehow steer local population um, in general in order to, to to participate in these projects but what is also very important to understand is that the many of the projects in fact are implemented by international organizations non-governmental or governmental international organizations from the united nations system but also other uh, european union and Many of these projects were also implemented by OECE during uh, many, many years until it was closed. But what is important is also that these, these connections uh, are, are uh, not clearly uh, show, um, uh, uh, highlighting the role of the localization. It's, there is a connection between different levels, international, state and local level. And the, the, the assumption is that, uh, in fact, these actors, they need to uh, basically to, to, to receive some capacity building, especially to uh, related to how to organize themselves and how to regulate some policies and also be better informed in order to bring about peace building uh, efforts uh, to some uh, positive effects. Then when we look, look also at nonlinearity, what is uh, interesting to see here is the, that there is a strong axis between two priorities of a European Union um, peace building efforts in this period. On the one hand, it's confidence building within Ukraine between different levels, and it's connected very strongly to the uh, protection of human rights and democracy, and also to some extent to and they connected both of these elements to women and children. I'm talking about these elements because they are uh, the elements uh, prominently featuring um, across 16 possible priorities of the European Union intervention in, in, in Ukraine in terms of peace building, because this instrument, in, uh, instrument contributing to stability and peace can also support, for example, activities related to population movements or um, transitory justice. It was not very highly uh, prominent in these projects, but we can see that many different priorities were there. So there is a coexistence of office assistant types with strong axis of confidence building human rights uh, connections as featuring in uh, 14 out of uh, 29 interventions, which is the half of the of the intervention. So here we can we can understand better um, this this uh, priority. And then when we look at the, uh, what kind of needs European Union uh, in relations with the local uh, and, and state actors uh, identified in Ukraine in this period, uh, we can observe that in fact, uh, there are two, three different uh, clusters of, of needs. Cluster of need of the state uh, to state political stability, local security stability, and local recovery of population which is uh, also very interesting from the perspective of um, connections in this uh, complexity thinking that there is still a kind of connection between local and state level. On the one hand, state political stability should contribute to some extent uh, to the local security stability, of course, on the related to the south and east of, of, of Ukraine. And also there was a lot of emphasis put on the local recovery of population suffering from uh, from in, during this period from the from the uh, low intensity but still combats and of course movement of uh, uh, 
uh, of, of population across across the, the borders from from the occupied territories to, to, to the territory of Ukraine. But maybe I can uh, highlight here state resilience and local resilience are very much a lot uh, marginalized needs as identified by the European Commission. But they are still uh, still 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 there. Um, when we look at a little bit more complex and uh, more nuanced post-crisis needs uh, 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 visualization of the networks, uh, we can see again that security stability features very strongly both at the state and local level. And there is also a, a lot of uh, connections between, in fact, state institutions and local recovery, local reconciliation, and local uh, resilience, local human rights protection. So. What we can observe here is, is a very strong uh, interrelation between state and local, which goes a little bit against what uh, many um, uh, researchers uh, claim that the genuine uh, resilience should be localized, not, not involve state uh, state uh, level, because then somehow state level we, it will impose on the local population its will. And, well, this is this is of course to be debated, but I think that what is interesting here that in spite of this uh, uh, complexity, we can still distinguish some features of of the European Union interventions in Ukraine, uh, which can uh, resemble some um, uh, complexity as quality thinking. Just to conclude, a couple of, of words about summarizing my research, also putting it into the context of the current uh, war in, in Ukraine. So what we observed, it's a quite ambivalent approach to the implementation of resilience in, in Ukraine. We have quality of, uh, of complexity in the system, the connections, but not too much thinking about complexity in the practices, especially when we think about project management practices, uh, because uh this is this is something that uh, uh, uh constrains the practices constrain the space for resilience thinking involvement of local stakeholders opening the space for for uh, innovation in in the approaches and um, at the same time uh localization and self-governance resilience approach coexist with exogenous implementers international organizations and also very central role played by central state institutions. So we can observe from this analysis quite idiosyncratic mix of different elements, still corresponding to the basic features of uh, complex um, systems. Well, now, if we think about the, the findings uh, and the situation uh, after the Russian uh, uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine, I think what we can see, of course, that Ukrainian resilience halted Russian invasion in in the first months that's that's for sure um, because of the one hand on the genuine self-organization localization of Ukrainian society to provide basic services organize the defense local defense uh, and etc but at the same time what we can see and this is maybe also very important um, um, for the next wave of, of research uh, about resilience in in, in the in view and of, the, of this war that the connection between central authorities and local communities was also very strong there was not only localization but also some kind of at least at the symbolic level uh, central authorities still uh, were playing very prominent feature in uh, a role in the in the, in the in the in the in the during this um, this war and still play very uh, prominent war represented by uh, president Zelensky and also ministers and um, because they symbolize the the operation of the uh, of the of the state and and also what we can see here it's a very interesting uh, uh, observation that external actors of course not only uh, European Union NATO but also many many humanitarian efforts from the United Nations but also from uh, uh, NGOs they contribute to the Ukrainian uh, struggle in reaction to the war, but they react also to the local and state needs. So they are much more open, not imposing what should be done, but they mostly, and we can observe this from local activities in many places, that they receive inputs from the local needs and then they uh, try to contribute with goods, with services, with some um, kind of... Uh, uh, things that are needed and they are claimed and they are demanded by by local uh, and state uh, authorities and local population 
so and and this i think is, is something that uh, should be researched of course the um, enormous uh, effort of different um, um, uh, in, um initiatives private initiatives contributing to to uphold the resilience of, of the society and also of the state so Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the next presentations. I don't know whether we have uh, some kind of Q&A later or we can, we can have some, but thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present my, my, my findings and uh, looking forward to the further presentations. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michal. We have, uh, uh, yeah, after the three presentations, we will have, uh, if everything goes according to plan, half an hour of question and answers. Uh, so then we can we can take uh, also questions on your paper and we would now proceed uh, with the paper uh, by uh, Joanna and uh, Christian uh, on the EU's Eastern Partnership and Ontological uh, Security. Um, Christian and Joanna. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for giving us the floor. It's a great pleasure to be there with you and, and to discuss this important topic. I mean, when we started discussing the topic, about EU Eastern Partnership, Ontological Security and EU Ukrainian Russian Warfare. Um, obviously, when we initially discussed this, this wasn't quite about uh, military warfare, at least the paper wasn't, uh, although of course uh, in Ukraine there certainly was a dimension of that already, but now we have a full blown war, so in that sense this paper has acquired an even more important dimension as it were. So. Uh, we're really delighted to, to, to get the chance to really discuss this in much more detail with you. Um, the idea here of the paper is to examine how both Russia perceived the security within Europe's Eastern Partnership, look at how, in a sense, explore how the EU and Russia have been shaping their own security agendas and how they react to various ontological insecurity triggers. What we're trying to do in the article also is to explore Russia's relationship with the West through the lenses of ontological security. And Joanna will tell you a little bit more about how we're framing this and, and, and so on in detail. But just in terms of the three uh, dimensions that we'll be looking at is the fears, the collective trauma, and the stigma of the USSR disintegration. But then also looking at it from the other way around in terms of how the European Union perceives this, what the perception is for the EU on the EU side in terms of uh, European security and examine how these fears and anxieties, in a sense from both sides, have been expressed throughout the Ukrainian war and what the impact of the uh, ensuing policies, especially in the EU, uh, have been, and also in terms of how the EU uh, explores its own resilience in terms of the war. Let me actually see if I can't put this into presentation mode because I've got, I have it already, there you go. And now I hand over to Jonah. Hello, good morning. Um, well, yes, uh, just picking on, on what Christian was saying when we started writing this article, um, there was no uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. No, we only had um, 2014 annexation of Crimea, uh, but we were already looking at some several signs of destabilization uh, amongst the, the, the six countries of the Eastern uh, Partnership. Um, and we always wanted to, 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 to have this uh, article as, as an examination uh, of an emotional battlefield and how emotions actually played a huge role um, in the path uh, and, and in shaping how uh, both sides portrayed. And curiously, and at the same time, unfortunately, many things that we had in the initial article, so the, the, the article itself is 80%, 80 percent, uh, um, the same we had before the invasion of Ukraine had to be adapted because in a certain way was almost premonitory of, of what could have happened at, in the end happened um, because the signs were already there. So this, this tension on both sides uh, was already there as, as key triggers, obviously, for, for this anxiety. Um, 
the, the fall, uh, the disintegration of the USSR, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and with that obviously came uh, territorial loss. And this has provoked um, a lot of anxiety uh, on both sides. On the Russian side, obviously, because it had lost territory. Uh, this was a huge humiliation um, at the internal level. But on the Western side, it was also uh, very problematic because in a sense, the West also had uh, the, the, a problem in hands on what to do with this new um, uh, newborn uh, countries, uh, born out the, the disintegration of USSR and how to, to support them and how to intervene without intervening. Um, so this was actually the first point um, of anxiety on both sides on what to do. Uh, on, on, on one hand, we had a humiliated Russia that was wishing to take part uh, of, of, of Europe that felt itself uh, European. But on the other hand, a lot of apprehension on the, on the Western side. Um, so we thought that it would it would be pretty interesting to to use ontological security theory uh, to look uh, and to examine um, how Russia portrayed itself towards um, the West and in the specific case the European Union, and on the other hand, how the European Union uh, felt um, uh, Russia's actions against the EU and the West. Uh, and how it also shaped its agenda. Next, please. <clears throat> uh, so we all know that the neighborhood uh, policy was launched in, in 2004, and this was a very first attempt, political attempt, to, to have um, um, kind of a co collaboration uh, with the, the new six uh, Eastern Partnership countries um, that uh, include Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. And the, the first and key uh, primary objective was to maintain closer political and economic relations between the EU uh, and these countries, but also with a vision to promote stability, prosperity, uh, and democracy uh, in the region. So the, the partnership uh, was born out of this idea uh, of creating a, a so-called ring of friends, uh, but it was also born uh, with several uh, fragilities, uh, especially some of the, of, the, of the countries of the Eastern Partnership, namely, <coughs> namely um, Belarus uh, and, 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 and Ukraine, were, were, were two of the countries that had several uh, uh, fragilities in terms, of, um, in terms of the construction of identity, in terms of uh, how they saw themselves. And, and at a certain point, this uh, investment in the partnership was seen as um, quite intrusive, especially by Belarus that was always aligned with Russia. Next. <coughs> Next, next, Christian. Okay, so uh, in a sense, um, we have uh, two competing visions uh, of, of Russia that are antagonistic. So we have on one hand, um, Russia as expansionist power. So these two antagonistic visions are how Russia saw itself at, at a certain moment. Uh, so Russia as an expansionist power um, sees uh, um, um, also has on the other side, uh, on the other side, Europe as uh, feeling threatened by this expansionist Russia. And on the other hand, you had some visions of Russia as a victim of European expansionism, where the EU, um, whereas the the EU, on the other hand, was uh, promoting uh, ideas of more inclusive, <laughs> inclusive uh, Russia. Uh, Emails, Christian. <laughs> Christian, okay, I, I will I will continue. Uh, so basically, um, these two ontological and competing visions of EU Russia relations um, also are very um, clear in in what uh, ontological fear, uh, security fears uh, are expressed at a certain point. 
uh, and they outline two different and separate visions that we uh, actually put on the paper. One, Europe threatened by expansionist Russia, and the secondly, uh, one the the EU as a more inclusive towards um, Russia. Uh, and here you have already a, cl a classical um, peer dilemma that under it is underneath uh, one of the ontological security uh, theory um, arguments. Um, so when you have this type of, of, of security uh, dilemma, uh, you actually try to 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 find answers on on one hand, what is your what what builds you as 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 an identity uh, um, and what is yourself and what is the other and the other uh, for Russia uh, was since um, um, the first invasion of Crimea everything that was portrayed by the West either uh, by the EU or NATO forces or even any force that could challenge and defy. Um, what was known as the the the, the, the exceptionality uh, of Russianness. Um, obviously, after after um, Boris Yeltsin is replaced um, by by Vladimir Putin, uh, the sentiments in, in Russia were already quite heightened. Um, and and when Putin uh, arrives into the power, he starts to to express uh, his own vision uh, of a strong Russia. And he starts with several emotional speeches. So we analyze several uh, speeches uh, from both sides. Um, and the first speech, um, uh, he mentions that he wants uh, to, to raise uh, Russia from uh, his, uh, from, from the, the lowest position and the lowest, um, moment of its life, so raising uh, Russia from the knees. Uh, and this was actually the first, uh, one of the first emotional speeches that he has. And from then onwards, there was an escalation on, on not only his love for Russia, but the question of identity, the question um, of, of what defined uh, what we, uh, what we, uh, mentioned as a Eurasianist uh, theory, um, and and to get back on the international stage, uh, Putin's uh, Russia was forced basically to to reimagine uh, its identity in in a, a shared future, um, and obviously, inevitably, the more uh, flexible and malleable uh, the post-Soviet Russia's identity, the easier it would be to to define pragmatic objectives uh, adapted to the new challenges. And with this, you have several uh, moments. And although um, uh, the, the psychological security is not always uh, in the same line of physical security, they are completely intertwined. And, and, you, and since uh, the, the disintegration of USSR, we have been assisting to an escalation not only of this emotional speeches, but also accompanied uh, by actions. Uh, one of the first ones, um, uh, the Georgian-Russian war in 2008, then you have the annexation of Crimea, and then you, uh, the, the speeches uh, have a continuously um, growing um, signs that uh, this idea of identity, this idea of Russia as victim, this is idea of Russia as being manipulated by the West has been uh, growing until um, the annexation of Crimea and now uh, the second uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, next. I think it's now you, Christian. Okay, thank you. So now we apply this particularly to the specific case of Ukraine and the EU-Russian interaction here. We look at both 2014 and 2022 onwards. The, in general, what we can see is obviously, I mean, a number of people have used all sorts of 
uh, big words. Uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, he called it a Zeitenwende. We've seen a number of different ways of describing the kind of impact that it has had on European security more generally. But of course, in the interaction between the EU and Russia, we've seen a kind of a, a tit for tat in terms of sanctions. We've had a combined effect of the sanction that is, as the EU tends to point out, unprecedented in both its scope and its nature. They're very severe. There is, in fact, indications also that uh, Russia didn't expect those sanctions to be quite as significant as they eventually um, were. Those restrictions in general, they include sanctions that were imposed on various individuals, and we have a whole list of the, the, the details of the various sanctions. There's, there's 10 different rounds of sanctions that we've listed in the article. So the sanctions imposed on individuals as well as on entities. We have very severe also financial and trade restrictions. We have very significant restrictions on Russian media broadcasting and also on restrictions aimed that are uh, aimed particularly at sensitive industries such as aviation, energy, high technology. Basically, the idea here is in terms of uh, Russian economy that Russian economy cannot develop any further uh, with the idea of obviously then hindering their war efforts uh, in, in, in terms of Ukraine. In terms of reaction, we can see though that in terms of advancement, as much as those sanctions are quite significant, um, the process by which we were getting to the sanctions has also been one of, of fear and cautiousness. The EU's reaction to the advancement, uh, advancement of Russia and also to the exponential threat that increasingly increased over time revealed that its response has really been a balance between the fear. We, we've seen that, of course, a number of times the Russians were very openly threatening Europe. Just yesterday, we heard again how there were going to be uh, potential rockets on the ICC in The Hague and, and, and possibly going down on the Reichstag in Berlin as well. Um, fear because also the second invasion of Ukraine was the realization of, of what might be now an old repressed aspirations by the Kremlin of its own grandness, a dream that is also um, driven by his aspirations towards reviving old borders. We can see that also with the decision yesterday in terms of um, stationing nuclear weapons in Belarus, but also a certain cautiousness on behalf of the EU because the idea of having an offended weak Russia was um, perceived to be frightening, um, frightening as the invasion itself, in the sense that um, there's often the, the, the question, well, what do we do if Russia falls apart? I mean, very often that is something that people are concerned about. Now, the sanctions themselves, well, following uh, Putin's decision to recognize the two pe so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk as independent republics, the EU first imposed its first wave of sanctions on the 22nd of February, 2022. The military assault as Russia went in was then met with additional packages of progressively severe sanctions, which were approved first on the 25th, 28th of February, then on the 22nd and 15th of March, on the 8th of April, 3rd of June, 21st of June, and the 22nd of July, as you can see, um, always reacting towards uh, the military advances on the battlefield. The eighth package was then approved on the 6th of October as a direct reaction to the unlawful annexation of Ukrainian areas in Donetsk, Luhansk. Um, and the latest package was then finally approved on the 16th of December, 2022. Now, let's conclude. Um, in terms of the Russian message, it's very clear that it's not about uh, pushing a communist message. The identity uh, of Russia itself has, of course, changed. It is more about uh, pursuing military control, control of the post-Soviet space, but control that has clearly, in a number of speeches, gone way beyond the post-Soviet space, has e even been drawn its battle maps up until the former zones of influence of the Soviet Union, which includes even East Germany, in that particular 
conception of, of Russian uh, power control. The objective here is to reshuffle and reshape the continent's liberal and security order. Russia's military invasion of Ukraine in February 22 was first and foremost a warning also that uh, prior EU's policies on Russia were inconsistent and lacked a preemptive vision regarding Putin's aspirations. What we can say uh, perhaps slightly flippantly is that the EU had a technocratic view of what Russians, uh, Russian ambitions were vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Europe. They thought they're dealing with a different power that has different interests and the EU could express its interests and Russia could express its interests and then there would be some level of compromise. The EU, if you remember, even invited Russia to join its European neighborhood policy, which Russia then rejected and said, no, no, oh no, we're far too important for this. Um, thinking that they're dealing with a power that is uh, interested in being involved in this type of policy making, the EU subsequently developed its own uh, neighborhood policy only for Russia, which was then obviously stopped with the first invasion of, of Ukraine. But what we can see here is that in a sense that policy was inconsistent, lacked a preemptive vision, lacked an understanding also that the EU was getting into a geopolitical, um, geopolitical territory without perhaps even understanding that it was. Um, the two invasions of Ukraine provided us with a wealth of lessons that the EU must also rapidly absorb to engage in a more uh, substantial, more articulated strategy towards the countries of the European uh, neighborhood policy and particularly the Eastern partnership. The, I think, conclusion that a number of policymakers have drawn, and we don't bring it out as much in the in the article, but I think the conclusion that most policymakers have drawn is that ultimately uh, the Eastern Partnership, that was this kind of policy area, something in between enlargement and um, association with the Eastern Partnership may have run its course, that the EU has had to decide, of course, whether those countries will become full member states, and it has already accorded candidate status to Ukraine, it has accorded candidate status to Moldova, and it might in time also do the same for Georgia. Um, but in general, um, this is the space that it has entered, and it needs to now also develop a policy how to deal with a uh, position that it has, in, in the sense that it is in a vulnerable position. We are seeing that in terms of um, weapon supply to Ukraine vis-a-vis um, -vis Russia's aggression. I'm not entirely sure that the EU has found an answer to that. The EU is responding as it were, but I, I, I haven't seen a clear response as a fully developed answer, shall we say. Okay, I'll, I'll end on this note. I thank you very much and I look forward to your questions and discussions. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Christian and Joanna, and I pass the floor to Kirsty. Uh, thank you, Giselle. Thank you so much for uh, bringing us together. It's good to see familiar faces and uh, nice to have a chance to, to discuss this paper, which uh, in my case was fully written uh, before uh, the full scale invasion and it was actually published uh, a year ago, uh, very soon after the start of the uh, full scale invasion. Uh, but um, what one can say today is that this main idea in my paper about uh, how connectivity matters for security and how it is intertwined with uh, geopolitical contestation in the Eastern Partnership countries, it's even more relevant and uh, certainly more obvious today than it was uh, like a couple of uh, years ago. Um, I don't have any slides, so I will just uh, go through the main uh, points made in the, in the article. Um, starting from this uh, concept of uh, connectivity, it's very close to the concept of networks, this idea that uh, in contemporary societies, uh, we are all intertwined by, by uh, flows of people and goods and trade, energy, money, information, etc. And that is something that creates uh, opportunities, but it also creates uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, where the EU has had a very kind of 
liberal view on connectivity in general, uh, stressing that uh, connectivity has to be rules-based, that it has to be open, that open networks uh, and open trade, the open connections is something that is uh, uh, beneficial uh, for by, by way of creating prosperity and, and also perhaps uh, increasing uh, security and stability. But what we have seen over the past uh, years is that uh, on the one hand, this connectivity has become a kind of a buzzword and very much used in EU rhetoric, especially in relation to Asia, less uh, in the Eastern Partnership policy. Uh, and, and this kind of EU's open, uh, open view of connectivity uh, is what you find in the EU documents. But at the same time, there has been this very, uh, very fast uh, dynamic where the EU has become more aware of the vulnerabilities that can come with connections and this very idea that uh, you actually need to uh, differentiate between uh, different types of connections the kind of direction and density and quality of connections is something that has an impact on your security and that there are actors that actually may use um, your dependency on certain connections with them as a tool against you, uh, as a way to, to weaken, weaken you. Um, so this is the kind of uh, broader debate in Europe. And uh, looking at the Eastern Partnership policy, connectivity has been one of the four main priorities of Eastern Partnership uh, since 2015. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it is an important aspect and it's kind of um, defined in the EU documents as, as separate from uh, trade and people-to-people -people contact, contacts, but these different uh, priorities are, of course, uh, closely, uh, closely interlinked. Um, a few more words on the conceptual approach uh, in uh, my article. I make this distinction between liberal and realist views on, on connectivity. And um, um, as I said, uh, the EU's liberal view is kind of about stressing um, rules-based nature, but also sustainability and comprehensiveness and openness of connections. Uh, but then we have uh, on the Russian side, um, a bit different uh, view on connections as uh, tools of uh, geopolitical influence, uh, which has been most uh, visible in the field of uh, energy and, and uh, over uh, many years. Uh, it's not, uh, not a very recent uh, phenomenon. And if we look back uh, in the history of the EU and then uh, the Soviet Union, uh, we can also see that uh, in the case of the EU, having these open networks with like, multiple centers and uh, various crisscrossing connections, but without like uh, one dominant center has been a feature of European integration and kind of reflects this uh, model in the EU of multi-level governance and complex interdependence. Uh, but then in the Soviet bloc, uh, what you had was a very centralized network of infrastructure and economic activity, which was kind of then reflecting and, and also serving the, the centralized regime and the totalitarian control. And we can still see the traces of these very different uh, models um, today in, in uh, the region between, uh, between the EU and, uh, and Russia. And, and uh, one difficult issue indeed uh, for the EU has been to how to view the, the uh, impact of connectivity on security. And this kind of liberal thought uh, tends to make a distinction between uh, the economic sphere and security sphere. Uh, it uh, does look into the connections. If you think of the liberal interdependence theory, uh, it uh, discusses a lot uh, um, the impact that economic interdependence uh, 
uh, may have on security, but still it kind of tends to look as, at the two as, as, as uh, separate uh, and separable uh, fields. And, and then also has a strong interest in the possible positive impact of interdependence on enhancing security between, between states, because uh, presumably growing connections then uh, make it more costly to, to uh, engage in uh, military conflict or, or even non-military conflict, and, and uh, are supposed to make uh, states more, uh, more cooperative and more keen to kind of uh, develop uh, norms-based uh, structures. Uh, but then the kind of realist uh, view on uh, connectivity and networks uh, emphasizes competition and control and, and uh, sees uh, um, connections as, as uh, a tool of uh, influence uh, that uh, states can use and uh, indeed stresses this uh, uh, need for major powers to control networks in order to be able to, to uh, have uh, geopolitical influence. So a very different view from, from what the EU usually um, uh, kind of applies and what kind of worldview the EU has, has had. And, and now uh, if we look at the Eastern Partnership, the empirical part of my article um, there is very little research on this aspect of connectivity um, in the Eastern Partnership uh, policy. Um, but um, a lot of uh, references in various EU documents uh, to, to this issue of connectivity. So, so um, it was quite interesting to see then uh, how the EU applies the concept uh, in, in uh, practice. And, and um, there are uh, several uh, aspects or several uh, fields of connectivity. Energy is certainly the most uh, important one, uh, where um, I would say the EU's awareness of the geopolitical implications of energy connections has uh, been developing over a longer period of time. Uh, but then there is also uh, the whole issue of uh, developing infrastructure in the Eastern Partnership uh, countries where um, one can kind of see that the infrastructure connectivity projects in the Eastern Partnership region have also been influenced by the EU-Russia kind of um, tensions uh, over the, the uh, Eastern Partnership uh, region, but uh, this geopolitical aspect uh, is something that the EU was largely in denial about um, in, in the period that I was, uh, I was studying. So the EU was pursuing its uh, infrastructure projects, uh, but it did not kind of frame them in any way as connected to security or geopolitical contestation uh, over the region. Um, well, looking at the energy field, of course, we've seen huge changes now during the past uh, year. Uh, so that's something that I would have to completely uh, rewrite uh, today. But um, a couple of years ago, we were still in a situation where uh, you had a new EU energy strategy that was kind of acknowledging the risks of uh, of too high level of dependence on, on Russian energy sources. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there was very little um, being done in concrete terms to uh, reduce uh, the, the uh, dependency. And, and uh, there had been the gas conflicts between Russia and Ukraine, which were affecting uh, Europe uh, uh, like long time ago, in, in January 2006 and January 2009. Um, but uh, still the EU, uh, or member states even more than the EU collectively, um, many kind of had still this idea that uh, energy relationship is something that um, you can uh, keep separated from the geopolitical tensions and that you can try to use as a 
as a way to, to um, have um, positive interdependence. Uh, Germany in particular was, uh, was sticking to this idea uh, until, until uh, recently. And uh, I, I also discussed in the paper shortly the Nord Stream uh, projects, um, which uh, at that time were, when I was writing were, were about to be completed. Um, now, of course, we are, we are uh, in a situation where actually the energy connections uh, have been uh, almost completely cut uh, between the EU and, and uh, Russia and nobody anymore denies that, uh, the, uh, that the energy dependence uh, is something that uh, has had a major uh, impact on security in Europe and is intertwined with the geopolitical uh, conflict. Um, but what the EU was doing, although it was kind of uh, uh, staying within this uh, largely this kind of uh, positive interdependence uh, thinking, but at the same time it was actually supporting uh, Ukraine's and other Eastern partner countries' uh, efforts to diversify their uh, energy policy and, and uh, modernize the, the Ukrainian uh, gas transmission system and, and uh, and uh, the EU was supporting different ways to incre increase energy uh, security of the Eastern partner uh, countries. Uh, then things started to move uh, much more quickly um, after the full-scale invasion started. For example, in March last year, uh, the synchronization of Ukrainian and Moldovan electricity grids with the EU uh, actually was, was decided on. Uh, it had been uh, discussed over a longer, longer period of, uh, of time. But uh, indeed, now it's very obvious that this uh, um, uh, kind of future uh, European integration of Ukraine it involves uh, the field of energy and this kind of integration of, of uh, Ukraine also in, in, that, uh, in that sector. Um, on transport, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the geopolitical aspect of it was not really uh, reflected in any way in the, in the documents, um, but um, the Eastern partner countries themselves um, actually saw this uh, geopolitical relevance and, and they were very much interested in uh, the transport uh, projects of uh, the Eastern partnership uh, policy and very much keen to have this EU support to, to strengthen their infrastructure. Like weakness of infrastructure is uh, still a major problem in the region. And of course, again, today we are in a completely different situation with all the destruction of, uh, caused by the war. Uh, but uh, even before, uh, before the full-scale war, uh, this need to, to uh, uh, Need, need for major investments in infrastructure in the Eastern Partnership countries was obvious because the infrastructure was so underdeveloped. So now it's a matter of you know, when we get to the point of reconstruction and then uh, creating an infrastructure that is compatible and, and uh, linked to the EU structures uh, will be one of the major, major tasks. And then one more interesting element um, in this uh, topic is, is um, uh, the aspect of uh, Asia and China connectivity. Um, it was uh, included in the Eastern Partnership uh, connectivity, um, uh, connectivity policy to also look at the Eastern Partnership region as, as um, part of this Europe-Asia connectivity. And uh, the Eastern partner countries themselves were also very much interested in so kind of economic opportunities in, in uh, being part of these uh, uh, major uh, schemes of, of Europe-Asia connectivity. Um, and and uh, also relevant for, for, um, for this Asia aspect, uh, just to mention uh, the increased uh, um, importance of uh, China for uh, trade of the Eastern partner countries. Uh, China 
um, became a more important uh, partner uh, for, for some of the Eastern partner countries uh, than Russia. Um, and and uh, Chinese investment uh, uh, in, in also in the transport infrastructure uh, projects uh, was becoming quite uh, important in the region. Uh, so that's a very interesting question then for future. Uh, what will be the role of, uh, of uh, China in the Eastern Partnership region? Again, we are in a very different situation now that we see China kind of cautiously, but still uh, um, supporting and backing uh, Russia in the war uh, with kind of limited ways and trying to not uh, pass the threshold of becoming uh, a target of uh, Western sanctions itself, uh, but nonetheless uh, being on the side of, of Russia. So what does it mean for China's future role in the Eastern Partnership region and the kind of uh, Europe, Asia connectivity? Asia, of course, is not only about China, it's also <laughs> uh, much, much broader than that. Um, so that's uh, that's just something to be to be followed uh, in in future. Um, I think I will I will stop there. Um, just to repeat again this kind of main point that uh, connectivity is hugely important for security and geopolitics, and, and uh, Ukraine is a very interesting case for exploring uh, how connectivity matters and then we will be also an important uh, case in the connectivity discussions in future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kirsty. Uh, I think all our uh, three uh, presentations now provided plenty of food for thought and especially also thank you that you related um, your papers also to you know, the current developments uh, and of course uh, the, yeah, the impact um, also on you know, what what you had been writing or perhaps foreshadowing um, also already in your articles um, to, you know, to to the situation that we're facing right now after the Russian invasion. So thank you very much uh, also for these reflections. I would now like to open the floor to um, questions and answers. And um, if you could, there's two possibilities. You could type your answer in the chat. I believe um, uh, that is one option, or ideally uh, that uh, you ask it by raising uh, your hand. So I'm just trying to find that I see all the participants on the screen. I'm not quite sure um, how I could do this, um, but uh, maybe when you raise your hand, we should see it. Um, any questions? I first take a couple of questions and then pass them on to our contributors. Who has a question? Okay, we have here uh, questions. I'll just read out the ones that I received in the chat right now um, from Anna Navarro. Uh, thank you for presenting your research projects in such an interesting way. I have a few questions, and this are uh, mainly for uh, Christian and Joanna. How do you think the individual agency of Putin in shaping Russia's identity has impacted his foreign policy since he is in power? And would it have been different under a leader with different ideas and aspirations? Um, and the second question, oh, she has a lot of questions. What kind of engagements for specifically should the EU follow with those countries in a vulnerable position vis-a-vis -vis Russian aggression? And third, what should be the role of NATO today in liaison with such EU strategy. Now, my suggestion is that we open this also to um, uh, uh, Christy and, and Michal, uh, because you're, of course, also formidable um, uh, experts in, in that field. So um, shall we then take um, these three questions? And uh, in the meantime, I'll try to identify who has questions and raise their hands. Um, so please, perhaps, um, uh, uh, Christian, Joanna, you want to start and then uh, Kirsty and Michal uh, would like to add. Perfect. I think we can have a, an interesting debate around that because obviously I don't have the, the truth necessarily. 
But certainly I think there's something interesting in there. I think in the Western representation of what's going on there, this is very much driven by one individual, which is Putin that is driving everything. And to a certain extent, you can understand why one would take that view because um, very clearly power is concentrated in one particular individual at the, at the, at the top of a pyramid, which is really, um, producing that type of vision that, that Russia is, is of course influenced primarily by Putin. And in, in, in a lot of ways it is correct. Uh, certainly if we had had Gorbachev or Yeltsin, one could argue that perhaps things might have gone a little bit differently. Nonetheless, I think what we also need to kind of underline is while there is that element of individual agency in Putin and clearly he's been pushing for that ever since he became the Russian president. He started his course in terms of developing the various pipelines with Germany. He also then developed a particular autocratic vision for Russia and, and, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, some of the issues that we discussed, whether that is the anxieties that Russia had, the humiliation and the dismemberment of the Soviet Union and so on, and especially also the, the potent force that Eurasianism has in terms of um, the shaping of ideology within Russia, we could perhaps also suggest that even with other leaders, we could have potentially perceived similar issues. Like for instance, the issue of Crimea, I might add that the, 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 the idea that Crimea is Russian is an idea that also Mikhail Gorbachev shares. So this is not something that is only Putin, but that is shared right across a large spectrum of the Russian Federation, including the people that from a Western point of view are our friends like Mikhail Gorbachev, but, but he would actually share that point of view also. Um, then in terms of where one might go, what kind of engagement should the EU follow? I think the EU needs to be very clear what it wants to achieve. If it wants to bring those countries closer to the European Union, if it wants to um, eventually offer the membership, if it wants to make sure that they become democracies, if it wants to make sure that they're integrated into a single market, the Russians will not be happy with that. I think they've made that very, very clear. And the EU can do that. And I think the EU has also, of course, that vision that those countries have their own agency, right? That they can take their own decisions, that they can, uh, in a sense, uh, be the masters of their own destiny. But in a sense, if the EU also shares that vision, and rhetorically, at least it does share that vision, then it needs to give them the tools to be able to do that. So it can't, on the one hand, say, okay, Ukraine, come closer to the EU, but then we're blocking your NATO accession, right? That's a kind of a double message that in a sense is, is, is quite dangerous actually. So the EU needs to be much clearer and, and NATO also needs to be much clearer. Now, what should be the role of NATO today? Um, well, I think very bluntly without NATO, um, you cannot secure the Eastern neighborhood. The EU on its own is incapable of doing that. The EU on its own is not yet able to fully provide uh, ammunition supplies to Ukraine. So uh, certainly uh, NATO is vital in, in this strategy. And I think without NATO, um, I think the EU will hit an impasse very soon. But I, I'll hand over to others because this is just my view and I'm sure there's other views out there. <clears throat> no, no, just very briefly, just to, to, to complete. Um, every every Putin speech in, in what regards uh, Putin's agency has, has been always uh, very emotional and, and, and picking up on, on politics of memory and, and using this politics of memory either by picking on, on, on trauma and, and the wounds of the past to, to, to create uh, um, uh, resilience in, inside, uh, inside Russia or, or to create more resilient Russians, Russians to tell them, listen, this is who we were, this is who we are now and see what they have done to our language, to our culture, to our territory. So all the speeches you will you will see from 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 Putin uh, have always this dichotomy between uh, love and fear, and 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 the way he portrays. Uh, I I believe uh, it it marks a, a, a very singular and peculiar uh, relationship with power. So on on that question, yes. 
he he has uh, an agency of its own. Uh, in this case, the men, it's it's bigger uh, than the country, I, I would say. In in what regards your 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 second question, um, this is this is important. The problem the problem with the Eastern Partnership it was it was a, a, an agreement that was always soft. It was always in a very lukewarm uh, waters, uh, and there was never um, a political definition uh, towards that space. There was not never um, a, a, a very formed and and strengthened. Um, vision towards what the EU wanted at, at political level. So you had this economic agreement and, and the cooperation agreement, uh, but in terms of how the EU would relate politically uh, with this with these six countries was never, uh, it was always ill-defined. And also this has uh, some correlations uh, with the fact that the first invasion uh, of Ukraine, obviously the annexation of Crimea, um, was not responded with a lot of with with muscular uh, sanctions from the EU side. So, it, basically, this was also taken by Russia as 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 uh, as an alert or as a sign that the EU would not respond um, on second invasion. What in the end uh, it did. Uh, but this is this is something that the EU needs to it needs desperately to to invest on. On on your third question, I think we are now assisting a new a new period where NATO and the EU are collaborating much more closer because uh, the threat uh, is is much more homogenous and and targets both NATO countries and EU countries. But it will always be difficult, uh, especially if we look at, at some at some at, at countries such as Sweden or Finland that have already this identity and memory clash uh, with Russia. So when anything that is decided ahead, it will always have this emotional um, backpack that is very heavy on both sides, and this has to be taken into account. Thank you. Uh, Christy, do you want to add? Yes, yes, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm of course, uh, every day thinking about these uh, same broad questions, so thanks, uh, thanks for the questions. Um, I think it's very important not to exaggerate Putin's personal role in this war. Um, uh, Putin's uh, personal obsession about Ukraine um, probably made a difference on a kind of tactical level, and it's it's um, it's significant. Uh, another leader uh, maybe would not have started this full-scale invasion, but at the strategic level, I don't think uh, he's views are in any way unique or different from many other people in the Russian elite and especially the security services that have uh, uh, a dominant role in Russia and whose uh, influence um, was of course very strong during the Soviet time but it was then never dismantled after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s uh, the security services were somewhat in the background, but they remained influential. And then, of course, with Putin coming to power, uh, they, they uh, came again uh, back uh, with uh, full vengeance and, and uh, um, having this very strong uh, idea about Russia being entitled to a sphere of influence and uh, very strong ideas about uh, great powerness of uh, Russia as, as one of the leading uh, uh, priorities uh, for, for the state. And um, it's important also to remember that um, this idea that uh, Russia should be entitled to a privileged role or some kind of sphere of influence in the neighboring countries, it never really disappeared. It has been there for hundreds of years. And, and even in the 1990s, which was the most liberal period, and Yeltsin being the most liberal leader Russia ever had, um, he was also very reluctant to let go of the Baltic states. 
Russia withdrew from uh, the Baltics, uh, the Russian military. In 1994, as a result of very strong uh, uh, Western pressure from the US and Germany, uh, but there was a lot of reluctance actually to, to, uh, to do it uh, among the Russian elite. And uh, of course, the relationship with Ukraine has always been um, uh, complex and always Russia having this tendency to deny Ukraine's agency and existence as a separate uh, nation and, and uh, state. Uh, so nothing uh, specifically uh, like uh, unique to, to Putin in this regard. So that's why we also should uh, be prepared for the next Russian leader, whoever it is, uh, to actually hold on to a similar vision of Russia's great powerness and sphere of influence. Um, then on the EU's engagement, uh, Again, we are in a completely different situation than, uh, than a couple of years ago. Ukraine and Moldova are candidate countries. So that already defines their future place in Europe. But where I'm a bit concerned is that um, I sense quite a lot of um, hesitation still in, in many old member states about moving ahead with the enlargement process. and. Uh, uh, the concerns uh, that uh, uh, member states, many member states have about uh, uh, internal reforms that are required in Ukraine and this whole issue of, of corruption. Uh, these concerns are valid, of course, but uh, I think it would be really important for uh, also as a message towards Russia and of course a message to Ukraine to, to um, have an EU approach that actually actively tries to work towards the goal of full membership. Uh, it will take time, but uh, we need uh, a policy that works in that direction and that uh, um, shows that the membership perspective is actually credible, that it is for real, and that we don't go into the same kind of uh, situation that has developed in the Western Balkans, where the kind of is enlargement, but uh, uh, there are a lot of doubts about whether the EU actually wants to see these countries as, as member states. And, and it's also um, important to note that in Ukraine uh, now you have uh, like massive public uh, support for the goal of both EU and NATO members. It's around 90% of the population. And of course, it's also enshrined in the constitution of Ukraine that Ukraine aims to join both organizations. Uh, so for Ukraine, the goals are very clear. And I think one lesson that the EU should have learned is, is that uh, um, having this kind of ambiguous uh, approach uh, through the neighborhood policy and this partnership policy and kind of engaging more with the countries, but uh, uh, not being ready to fully integrate uh, Ukraine and, and Moldova and others to, to the EU, that was really counterproductive. And uh, I, I fully agree that this uh, message that the EU was giving to Russia was that uh, if Russia tries to impose its vision on these countries, then the EU would not do very much to, to intervene or, or to, uh, to work against uh, the Russian agenda. And finally, on NATO, um, um, because NATO has been extremely cautious now uh, during the war about its uh, engagement. And it's interesting that uh, Ukraine has been positively surprised about the EU's role, but actually uh, disappointed at uh, the role of NATO as an organization. Um, it's uh, the US and uh, other countries, uh, NATO countries that have been giving uh, a lot of military support. But NATO as an organization has been stressing that it does not want to become party of the war. Uh, but I think here it's difficult to have this discussion about uh, future uh, Ukraine's NATO membership, but uh, uh, in order to have a consistent uh, European approach to Ukraine, I think NATO membership has to be also part of the, uh, part of the package. But it's something that um, can uh, 
can be actively addressed only once the war is over. Because as long as the war continues, uh, the NATO position is most likely to stay uh, stay the same. That NATO does not want to become party of the war, and it's therefore very cautious about any any uh, engagement. I'll stop there. You are muted, Gilal. You are muted. So sorry, uh, Michal. Maybe you can combine your answer with another question you received from Alena in the meantime. Please. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for for these excellent uh, contributions. I think that I can only echo uh, many of the points of of you just expressed. The, as regards Russia, Putin. I think uh, my my simple statement is that Putin, uh, Putin's agency embodies Russian's agency. This Putin, I, I think, in an autocratic, fully scale uh, regime, it's it's simply Russia at the same time, and he wanted that. <laughs> there is, of course, uh, some society which is silenced, but this is also the the, the way that uh, silence uh, echoes with, with with these views. So I, I think there is a very difficult to think about, um, you know, completely different type of of, of the last twenty years of, of of devolution of the uh, regime. Um, because of the societal uh, uh, background that that uh, Russia uh, um, has in, in in terms of the resentment, uh, anxiety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, talking about uh, vulnerability, of course, we focus a little bit on uh, vis-a-vis Russia. We focus on the neighboring countries, but I think what the last last war this war shows that vulnerable is the entire multilateral system. It's not only European continent or some neighboring countries within the sphere, um, this this uh, this war uh, has a broad impact uh, 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 across the globe in Africa, Latin America, in Asia. There is a, um, uh, and many countries that uh, are quite reluctant to to take sides in this in this conflict. They they don't even I think uh, imagine how vulnerable they are if the multilateral rule based system uh, collapses. And this is, I think, uh, the main uh, uh, purpose of this Russian-Chinese uh, alliance to to make uh, this this multilateral rules weaker. And I think many countries, smaller countries and mid-sized countries, they will only suffer from 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 this uh, great power uh, rivality uh, in, in in this sense. So I think it's not only about about the neighborhood; it's only really about the the institutions. It's about the the, the very fundamentals of the of the of the international system uh, uh, and the, the repercussions of this of this world are only to be seen how it uh, the realignment will will happen we can see many many different uh, reconsiderations across the globe you know Japanese involvement in in, in Ukraine uh, and and um, the the participation in different types of, of activities many countries which tries to to say we are neutral like me, latin america but in the end they are um, subject to to chinese russian uh, infiltration in for example in in uh, critical uh, sectors energy sectors uh, so here I, I i think what was the role for, for 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 the european union is of course to be very very active across the globe and of course, it's not possible to have an enlargement to everybody, but I think uh, the, the scaling up of the diplomatic efforts uh, is, is necessary. Uh, but also thinking about, about the, the third question, what is the role of NATO? Of course, NATO is cautious because the, there is come back to the original mission of Article 5, uh, trying to limit as much as possible out of the area engagement uh, after the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course, to maintain some kind of, of, of balance of, of deterrence with both China uh, and, and Russia. But what is interesting and sometimes and frequently, in fact, very uh, overlooked uh, mission, which is not very f accomplished by European Union, is its own defense policy, Article 24, Solidarity Clause. Now, if if the if the European Union can really um, develop here to to um, to uh, adapt this policy as, as as a security actor, maybe this NATO enlargement would be not so much necessary once we have a very strong uh, military uh, as um, capacity of the European Union to undertake all 
all uh, elements of the defense of countries uh, who are members of the European Union. So I, I think there is a mission also of the European Union to, to balance uh, uh, and, and reinforce it. Now we, we, we see that there is a plenty of, of uh, problems that we, we, uh, we inherited from last 20 years of neglect of developing defense uh, industries, et cetera, et cetera, preparing for out of the area interventions, uh, not defend, uh, preparing for the, the territorial defense, et cetera, et cetera. But I think this, there is a possibility for this article uh, 42 to, to think about it. But looking at the, at the question that uh, uh, Alena asked about how this complexity thinking uh, <laughs> can be uh, related to what we see in the, in the area of, uh, of uh, let's say, Russia's sphere of influence, I think what the complexity theory tells us is that it's very fragile always because complex systems, they evolve, they develop, and there are tipping points which can be very much unexpected and they can de uh, destroy the, the apparent uh, evolution of the system, which is which is um, uh, continuously uh, evolving towards some 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 uh, some uh, destiny. So, uh, for example, when I think about what happened, really, what is the tipping point of the situation that we observe today is the Yanukovych decision, I will not sign the treaty of the with the European Union. And then you know, the, the one decision which was, in fact, it put, uh, it triggered the entire chain of events, which were precisely not uh, very much planned. They were um, improvised many times, the invasion of, 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 uh, of, uh, of Russia, uh, by Russia of Ukraine, the, the, the latest stage. But for example, the occupation of Crimea, it was quite an improvised thing at, at some moment. The creation of this re guerrilla rebellion interference in Donbass. But everything happened because one person put twitter you know let's count ourselves on the maidan square of, of independence in kiev to protest against non-signing the treaty and 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 the, the the situation just evolved and this is complexity thinking that we cannot assume the full control of, of the systems that they are situations that that can uh unpredictably uh, happen and change the, the, the evolution of the entire situation. And, and we can think about the similar um, situations, in, in fact, in, in, in other places, uh, in, in the so-called sphere of influence by Russia in Central Asia, you know, some, some kind of, of, of conflict that happens. And then we can see, for example, bigger involvement of China in the mediation of, of, of conflicts in between Central Asian countries and Russia will not be only a country which uh, which will participate in the, in, in the in this in this uh, region in fact it already happens but it can be much more visualized when there is some symbolic uh, event like 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 this one so i i, I think um, there is um, one clear lesson that any system is very fragile and it evolves and it can be very easily uh, and very unpredictable as well uh, destabilized and this is a little bit of source of optimism, I think, that uh, that not all systems uh, which we, we we consider as detrimental are uh, eternal. And I think also it is a so, source of uh, uh, um, optimism for Russia because we see this is eternal. So maybe it's not eternal. There will be another aurora, liberal aurora, shooting somewhere, and then they'll, they'll, things will change quickly, and we are not able to predict them. But. And this is my, my my answer to this question uh, that that uh, maybe it's not a full feeling, but I think it will also uh, uh, need we would also need much more thinking about this in these terms. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm looking at the time. It's precisely one o'clock and I should therefore also close uh, the session. We have one unanswered question about the role of Turkey, though I believe that uh, we can most likely also uh, move that question and answer it in our next um, session. So I would uh, kindly ask um, uh, Elida uh, to, to perhaps wait um, until we reach the next session. So uh, let me then uh, please thank you, um, our contributors uh, to this uh, panel session. Again, thank you also for answering uh, the question in such an elaborate uh, way. Uh, I think it gave, again, a lot of food for thought. And I uh, just now, when I heard um, Michal talking, uh, I remembered, I think one of the Russian dissidents once said, uh, you know, in Russia, one, for 100 years, it's possible that nothing happens. And then everything changes in this 
you know, in, in, in the space of a few days. And um, the question is, of course, you know, what, what stage of that historical development may be, or maybe rather not be. Um, but I think from what we heard, um, so, so too much optimism uh, is perhaps not uh, very much in order. Um, so I leave you um, also with these thoughts. Uh, thank you again uh, to our contributors. Thank you for taking time in these uh, very, very busy, um, of course, also uh, moments in time. And uh, we reconvene at uh, two o'clock uh, with our next uh, panel session uh, with, again, uh, three, uh, what promises to be three very interesting contributions. So thank you so much. The same Zoom link uh, back to the session at two o'clock. And thank you, um, Kirsty, uh, Christian, Joanna and uh, Michal for your contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, uh, welcome back um, everyone or welcome if you've just now joined our conference today. I'm looking at Felix is the uh, technical organizational matters that we have to take into account. No, thank you so much. Yeah, that just shows that you've done an excellent job. Um, we would now uh, start with the second uh, panel today. This is, of course, the after lunch uh, session that uh, usually suffers for some delays with people joining, but uh, we are uh, full of optimism that we will receive uh, more listeners um, as we go along. Without uh, much further ado, um, I would uh, like to introduce the uh, presenters uh, to this uh, second panel. Again, for those of you who have just joined and uh, didn't uh, manage to be here this morning, um, this is a, a relay conference or, organ uh, or conference organized by the uh, Relay Project, uh, Jean Monnet Network Project, uh, run uh, by Brussels uh, Campus, and also uh, with project leader uh, Professor Christine Neuholt. Um, who has been uh, initiating this project um, some time ago. And uh, our uh, conference here takes place um, under the umbrella of the Relay project. But at the same time, it's also based on uh, a workshop in 2019, uh, where several uh, uh, contributors who are also uh, presenting today um, uh, made contributions that uh, are now uh, published as a special issue. And uh, we will uh, therefore uh, continue um, from this morning. Now we will focusing, we will focus on the many phases of uh, resilience, and we will start with a, it's a slight change in uh, in agenda, uh, simply because uh, uh, our colleague uh, Christian uh, Nitui has to leave uh, and for family duty. Uh, so we will uh, release him, of course, but uh, he will be starting uh, with his presentation this afternoon. Uh, Christian is a lecturer in diplomacy and international governance at the University of Loughborough, and he will be uh, talking about his paper on EU crisis thinking and its pursuit uh, for resilience in the Eastern neighborhood. And uh, Christian's uh, presentation will be followed by um, the presentation by Dr. Uh, Alena Vieira and myself. Um, Alena from the University of Minu, I'm based at the University of Maastricht, and we will be uh, discussing resilient people versus resilient autocracy, the many faces of resilience in EU relations with Belarus. And last but certainly not least, uh, we will um, be uh, listening to the presentation by uh, Domenico Valenza, who was PhD fellow, fellow at Ghent University and at, uh, you know, Chris um, uh, in uh, Bruges. And uh, this presentation will be on uh, fanning the flames and exploration of EU discourse on culture in the Eastern partnership. So without much further ado, uh, Christian, I'll uh, pass the floor uh, to you and your presentation. We have about 15 to 20 minutes uh, per presenter. Uh, we will uh, first uh, give the uh, three presentations and then that should leave us with about 30 minutes for question and answers from the audience. So Christian, floor is yours. Well, thanks Giselle and uh, 
thank you all for organizing the workshop and uh, the very fruitful process of publishing the special issue, which I think turned out uh, quite well. So uh, it's quite clear that the war in Ukraine has changed the way in which the European Union has focused on resilience. And when my colleague and I, Laura Das Simonov, wrote this paper, we were trying to understand what kind of changes did the adoption of resilience as a central aspect of EU strategy, what type of change actually did this uh, process create in the European Union? But now, if we are to look at resilience, resilience has already become a central aspect of almost everything involving the European Union from its strategies, decision-making process, the way in which it acts in the international order, the ambition that it has in world politics. And at the time when we started looking at what the resilience turn as it were means for European Union, we focused on how the European Union become, became much more inward focused. So resilience as a way of basically uh, dealing with the whole host of external and internal crisis that the European Union faced, particularly in the decade of the 2010s, but it also focused on embracing the concept of geopolitics. And this is a key part of our paper. At the same time, as we call it, securitizing the external environment. So the European Union, alongside embracing resilience, has come to, to be a bit more anxious and paranoid, I would call it. So identifying threats and challenges where, uh, let's say, in, in the beginning of the 2000s, it will see patterns of cooperation and areas where it could actually uh, enhance its, let's say, its role in, in the world order. So the literature at the time when we started looking at this topic uh, tended to point to the fact that uh, the resilience turn might have caused what's called um, paradigmatic shift in uh, the way the, the European Union behaves, particularly in foreign policy. And the paradigmatic shift in comparison to its former really ambitious approach to, to international politics based on this idea of ideas of normative power. Now, I'm not going to go that much into, into that debate, but what's interesting in, in the way the focus of the European Union on, on resilience, particularly in the Eastern neighborhood has evolved is that we've come to a sort of uh, full circle. So in, in the beginning, let's say 10 years ago, there, there was a hope that resilience would uh, influence the way in which the European Union would design its policies and approaches towards the Eastern neighbors. And this was primarily coming from the literature. And throughout uh, the 2010s, we've seen resilience morphing into, into a strategy for which the European Union was seeking to actually enhance its own resilience through the neighbors, through allowing, through providing uh, its neighbors, particularly in the East, the tools to become resilient themselves and through in that process, the European Union uh, would increase its own resilience. So in a way, I would argue the European Union was uh, outsourcing its resilience. Now this faced quite a lot of criticism in particular in the literature from scholars arguing that actually the European Union might be having a sort of post-colonial approach here. And it's the, the better way of embracing resilience would be to actually look at the needs of local communities in the Eastern neighborhood. So localizing resilience would be a much more, uh, let's say ethical approach rather than just focusing on the uh, interests and views of the European Union. And I would argue that 2019 and the beginning of 2020 were very much, if we look at EU documents, uh, dominated by this logic of including more local views. But with the pandemic and then with the Ukraine crisis, we've kind of uh, reverted to the idea of resilience focused primarily on advancing EU interests and uh, uh, in some way addressing EU fears and anxieties. And now if we look at uh, the way in which the EU has responded to the Ukraine crisis, again, uh, one may make a claim that actually uh, you 
the European Union has out, outsourced in a way its resilience towards uh, towards Russia to Ukraine. So Ukraine in a way is is fighting as a way of enhancing the resilience of the European Union. Now, obviously, we may debate this, and uh, it's uh, the war is a, is in itself a moving process, and obviously it has created a large amount of crisis thinking in the European Union, which is difficult to evaluate at this point. But it's important to understand that the basis of the approach of the European Union to the Ukraine war at, at this point, and, but also to the COVID pandemic uh, was to a large extent uh, created during the 2010s when the European Union was trying to figure out how to implement resilience into its policy. So in the paper, we focus on the dynamic between crisis and change. So we try to understand how the resilience turn was influenced by the various external and internal crisis that the European Union faced in the last decade. And primarily we look at uh, exogenous crisis and uh, those pertaining from the Eastern neighborhood. And as I said earlier, about five, four or five years ago, there was a debate regarding whether or not uh, the resilience turn created a new paradigm shift in the European Union. So by paradigm shift, uh, scholars focus on uh, uh, an important change in terms of ideas, practices, ideologies, interests, and worldviews in the European Union. And views were quite, I, I would say, uh, divided on whether or not actually such a paradigmatic shift occurred in the European Union or was about to occur. In our paper, we actually argue that such a shift has not occurred, that change has been gradual. We've seen a gradual reframing of what we call a state of business of as usual in the face of crisis. So what this means that when the European Union is anxious that it, it can't deal with new external risks and challenges, it actually reframes all policies, engages in minimal policy change. And when it does, it basically uh, emphasizes old policy ideas or gives more thrust to ideas that were already in the pipeline. And very often, the European Union is not really able to acknowledge failure. So failure is uh, either ignored or reframed as, uh, as something that is outside the ability of the European Union to manage. And policy revision in, in this case is a way of assuring a, a logical continuation of previous processes as well. So in the paper, in order to, to test these assumptions, we look at two aspects. So the scope of the change that um, the resilience turn caused in particularly in EU foreign policy and its approach towards the Eastern neighborhood and the way in which the EU's perception of the world order changed during this uh, period. So before the COVID pandemic, there was, in terms of scope, there was little evidence both in the literature, but both practically as well, that the resilience turn actually caused, uh, well, uh, led to the creation of new policy ideas and was implemented in a significant manner. So in, in a very exaggerated manner, some might say that actually up until uh, the COVID pandemic, it was mostly a lot of hot air. But again, this is an exaggeration. Uh, please don't quote me on this. And in our paper, we, we show how actually uh, resilience framed old ideas and old practices, but also emerging ideas and, and debate. So it was, it was a nice way of capturing some of the ideas that were in the pipeline for the European Union and some of the practices that the European Union wanted to, to test at the time. Now, the COVID pandemic gave a lot of thrust to to resilience and resilience has since then become a, a key part of the lexicon of the European Union and the way uh, it deals with, with challenges as well. And uh, in the neighborhood, uh, again, in the paper, we show that a large amount of the priorities of the European Union that uh, and the policies of the European Union that were already present were actually 
again, reformed, rephrased in a way that would be relevant to the concept of resilience. So at the time, there, there was this feeling that neighbors had to, had to become resilient based on the help and the tools provided by the European Union. And the problem was that the European Union itself did not have the tools to enhance its own resilience by itself. We all know the, the old debate, especially in foreign policy regarding the uh, capabilities expectations gap. Now, some might argue that with the war in Ukraine, we've seen uh, the European Union uh, developing some of these tools, especially when it comes to coordination in terms of defense procurement, for example. But one may argue whether or not these kind of small incremental steps actually mean that the European Union is able to enhance its, its own resilience from this perspective. So again, I would argue that the war in Ukraine has, has brought us to a first circle where Ukraine is, uh, well, is, is, is an uh, actor who is basically dealing from the perspective of EU-Ukraine relations with enhancing both its resilience, but that of uh, the European Union uh, as well. So the European Union, again, is outsourcing its resilience and providing quite little in return besides distant promises of membership. And I think in the previous panel, there was a bit of debate about uh, how, how membership uh, can be enhanced in some way. In terms of the second aspect that uh, we look at, we focus on the role of um, the European Union's worldviews and how they changed uh, in relation to the adoption of resilience as, as a key concept. And we argue that geopolitics was a key aspect that we need to look at when we focus on, on worldviews. And geopolitics, before 2014, before the annexation of Crimea, let's say, was very much both in the policy and academic debates, uh, a sort of paria concept. No one really wanted in the European Union to, to touch in any way the concept of geopolitics. There was this view that, that the European Union was not doing geopolitics, that it was in a way above these, uh, these let's say, uh, very malign, uh, consequences of power politics that influenced the, the, the Second World War, the Cold War, for example. So the European Union was elevated. Now, in, in the paper, we trace the way in which the concept gradually came to the fore in EU strategy. And it's important to note that even during this period of, let's say, the 1990s and the 2000s, especially in academic circles, but also in, in more policy-oriented circles in Brussels, there were still voices who argued that actually, on the one hand, the European Union, through its approach in the neighborhood, was engaged in a sort of geopolitics, even though it didn't have the same capabilities and ability as, as a nation state, while others were arguing that actually, the European Union should uh, admit that it needs to deal with geopolitics because other states around the world, and we see it now with Russia and China, Iran, India as well, have never uh, stopped seeing geopolitics as a key dynamic of the world order. So in the European Union, I would say in, in terms of uh, external affairs, resilience has become almost synonymous with being able to manage geopolitical uh, risk and tensions. And uh, in, in this process, events in the Eastern neighborhood, not only what is happening in Ukraine, but more broadly in, in Belarus, for example, or in Armenia, or even in Georgia, have prompted the European Union to gradually come to the realization that geopolitics is, let's say, a, a key dynamic of the world order and that it needs to embrace the concept. And since, uh, let's say the adoption of the global strategy with the new commission coming in 2019. And now with the strategic compass, the focus on geopolitics is tightly woven with the need to, well, with the idea of enhancing uh, resilience. But as I mentioned earlier, geopolitics has in some way been uh, discussed within the European Union for the last 30 years, even though uh, many scholars and policymakers for a long time didn't want to uh, admit 
the need for the concept to, to influence uh, EU foreign policy. Now, just, I'll finish on this point. So as I said earlier, there, there have been some steps taken uh, in terms of um, the European Union being able to act in a more geopolitical way. So if you look again at the strategic compass, even though it's very highly criticized, I would say, by, especially by, by academics, uh, the, the level of coordination and unity we've seen in terms of uh, providing support, especially military support to Ukraine, as well as the fact that we've seen these uh, military transformations within member states points to the idea that member states are much more willing than in the past to embrace the, the, this nexus between geopolitics and uh, resilience. But there's still the criticism of whether or not the European Union actually can develop in, into a full, let's say, geopolitical actor, and to what extent uh, its ability to act in, in this manner is influenced by its relations with NATO. And, and I, I listened to the question and answer session before, and there was, a, a, I think, that reflected a bit of confusion regarding the way in which uh, NATO and the European Union should interact. Because obviously, I, and again, if, if we look at, uh, it's, it, I'm, I'm not really sure I should bring this up, but if we look at people like Richard Sagba, who in the past argued, that there, there is a sort of discrepancy between uh, NATO in terms of being driven by American interests and the European Union having, a, let's say, a more autonomous defense approach. Now, with uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it seems very difficult to decouple from a defense perspective these two, these two tendencies. And on the one hand, this may open uh, the, let's say, the space for the European Union to create more coordination among the member states, but it might also make it a bit less relevant in comparison to NATO. So I'll end on this. I'll, I'll, I'll have to go for about 10 minutes at the end of the hour, but I'll try to come back for the question and answer session. Well, thanks again. Well, thank you so much, Christian. I think it's very good news also to hear that you may be able to join us again for the question and answer yes. session, because I'm sure that your paper has raised uh, plenty uh, of questions as well. So thank you so much. And um, we move on um, to uh, Alena yeah, and my paper. Uh, so I have uh, two heads on now, but uh, I let uh, uh, Alena also take care um, of, uh, of most of the paper. Alena, we have agreed. I'll, I'll give the first half of the slides. OK. Right. Um, so we, our paper, uh, very, very shortly, is is on the. Yeah, we were looking also at the time, of course, before uh, the uh, uprising uh, in Belarus in in 2020, 2021, and we were looking at the EU's policies uh, towards uh, Belarus and especially uh, the many faces, as we call it, of resilience in the EU's um, discourses, but also party practices vis-à-vis uh, -vis Belarus. Uh, so, Alina, do we? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so again, I don't have to repeat necessarily uh, what has already been said in other presentations, um, but uh, we've been, you know, looking at the concept of resilience and it's been debated in academia uh, very, very extensively. Uh, but what we uh, what we found, um, at least since we're focusing on Belarus already for a while, uh, that very often um, in the literature. The, the the problematic usage of the EU's yeah, resilience discourse vis-à-vis -vis autocratic regimes is not uh, very much um, highlighted or researched. And uh, this is then uh, also the reason why we wanted to uh, write about the EU's usage of the term resilience in its policies towards Belarus. Um, and uh, we believe also that this is now mm, uh, still very relevant subjects because when we are looking at the EU's uh, policies, not just foreign policies, but also external relations more broadly, uh, that are geopoliticizing, um, especially also after uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and we see that towards 
uh, yeah, the EU's energy dependence by reducing its energy dependence on the Russian Federation. And they've been looking, of course, for alternatives elsewhere of energy supply. And uh, autocratic regimes like Qatar um, or Azerbaijan have, have become, and others have become even more important. So um, here we believe, again, as, as was mentioned by um, uh, also by Christian earlier, the you know the focus again on EU's interests uh, or the sort of the EU's own geopolitics and the EU's own resilience um, may then also you know have serious implications for its yeah, normative agenda, especially with very autocratic regimes. So we believe it's still very relevant uh, paper, um, uh, it may be even more relevant than back in 2019. So what do we do in the paper? I think we can uh, switch slide, Alena. Uh, we are uh, yeah, doing a, a discourse analysis or critical discourse analysis um, uh, based uh, or yeah, rooted in the uh, politics of representation. So what we're looking at is political implications of say adopting one mode of representation, one particular way um, of defining resilience um, in the EU's narratives over, over other say definitions of resilience, to put it very you know, easily and bluntly. And we are looking at the EU's different uses, usages and representations of resilience, um, and especially also you know, looking at what you know, sort of underlying unacknowledged assumptions may be, or labels, or specifically also silences in the EU's resilience discourse. And uh, we draw on uh, a framework developed by uh, Miro and Newell, um, who are political geographers. And uh, they um, introduced the framework of the so-called five W's. So this is uh, critically analyzing or thinking through resilience by systematically analyzing discourses in terms of for whom resilience is supposed to be enforced or uh, created, for what, for when, uh, where, and also why, and for whose purposes. Um, and, uh, and that is what we do in our article. Uh, we look at uh, EU official documents, again, all, all before, so since um, uh, the uh, uh, neighborhood policy was put in place up until uh, 2004, up until um, 2019, uh, or the, yeah, up until uh, the uh, uprising and then sub suspension of EU um, Belarus uh, relations. And, uh, and that is, you know, here where we already move then to the empirical part and examination. Uh, very clearly, um, before the uh, European neighborhood policy review, um, that was yeah, the first moment when the EU act very explicitly um, acknowledged uh, re resilience um, in the uh, in its discourse on Belarus and uh, also on neighborhood policy, um, of course. And you can say that that was a bit of a turning point. Um, in the EU's discourse, at least, uh, um, uh, towards uh, state uh, resilience and officially um, also here the EU's, uh, yeah, in, in this communication, the EU's, uh, EU was very much focused on uh, economic resilience, uh, energy related, uh, uh, um, resilient information infrastructures, um, and so on and so forth. But that is more general. And now we move to the specific case of uh, Belarus. And then now I will talk about our findings in the context of commission um, uh, discourses. And then Alena will uh, focus um, on uh, the Council and also European Parliament, because here we also see uh, quite a few nuances. So uh, clearly, after you know, the launch of the ENP, and as Christian already noted, I mean, implicitly there was a focus on resilience, but never uh, that uh, explicitly in the EU's discourses. Uh, very much in the beginning, also in discourse uh, with Belarus, uh, or towards Belarus was the you know forces of nature. So resilience um, against forces of nature. It's about preparedness and response to natural and man-made disasters. Very much also how res resilience discourses evolved in the EU um, and elsewhere as well. Um, resilience to climate change, um, there was uh, as an element in Black Sea Basin cooperation that was, of course, back in the days uh, still considered quite important. Um, adopting strategies, uh, including Belarus, there to um, uh, tackle climate change. Uh, but what is already then rather you know, clear or obvious that when it came to Belarus, 
the most legitimate or actors identified to you know to to do or implement policy or changes or implement resilience uh, was the Belarusian government, especially uh, the Ministry of Emergency uh, Situations. Um, and uh, just as a side note, that was specifically uh, the ministry that later on um, during the uprising in Belarus in 2020, 2021, um, that was uh, the ministry responsible for uh, civil defense. Right, so the ministry that also you know, uh, sent out orders uh, to remove national Belarusian flags from buildings during the protests, um, and so on and so forth. So a, a big silence in this discourse already back then. So we're talking about 2013-14, and um, is the role of independent civil society. So in climate change, a topic that you would think is rather amenable or potentially open to role of civil society um uh, in uh, yeah it, uh, in, in 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 implementation or important here also in terms of resilience um but that's a big silence uh, and um and and we also know from interviews that that is partly because of the insistence of Belarusian government in the negotiations you know, that they did not um, want to have civil society officially acknowledged as legitimate actor so we can move to the next slide um, and then uh, this is the other big theme in the EU's narratives vis-a-vis -vis Belarus, uh, also uh, resilience of Belarus as an energy provider for the EU. As, as Christian mentioned before, exactly the same theme this is very much focused on EU resilience, the EU's resilience, um, and which was also critical subject based on um, the EU's uh, uh, energy security. Um, and we get um, a few references or several references to this. It's about ensuring unhindered and uninterrupted energy supply, um, helping to overcome uninterrupted emergencies, right, of uh, um, also oil uh, specifically deliveries um, from Russia via Belarus. And from 2016 onwards, it was also about energy interconnections um, and so on and so forth. So again, very much the focus was the Belarusian government um, and the policies, infrastructure policies that it had implemented. Um, and only later in this context, you know, we we, we, we there's some you know civil society uh, is mentioned, uh, but mainly in the context of yeah later well when it comes to uh, alternative sources of energy and input potentially from you know environmental NGOs and so on and so forth but that never really goes beyond the sideline and then we come to the last slide um, for me uh, on the uh, commission's narratives uh, another important narrative that also very much had implications or manifestation in the EU's practices was the one on uh, hard security and uh, especially border security. So here um, the Commission officially states well, we should ensure the security of the Belarusian population to make them more resilient to security threats and better prepared to prevent and respond to conflict and crisis. Uh, but effectively what was then in practice implemented were um, large-scale large projects, very big finances also involved of border management, integrated border management, um, uh, and so on and so forth. And that put uh, Belarus law enforcement authorities and civil servants uh, basically central um, to the implementation uh, process. And the EU has put enormous amount of money um, into this. And uh, secondly, uh, also economic uh, resilience, uh, enhancing economic governance, strengthening fiscal stability, structural reforms, improve, uh, improve competitiveness, and the typical EU discourse um, also here in, uh, in its relations with Belarus. But who is implementing? And again, a lot of the regional um, assistance uh, for this priority uh, get, went directly um, also to the Belarusian uh, economic ministry and civil servants. So again, in, in discourse and practice, it was very much a state-centric um, discourse and the resilience um, uh, where it's explicitly mentioned in the context of society or societal uh, resilience um, that mainly uh, pops up uh, here when it comes again to industrial accidents, uh, some of the environmental issues and so on and so forth. So I leave it here and then pass the floor um, to Alena for the other uh, institutions and discourses and the conclusions. Very well. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I will continue with the Council. 
And in the case of the Council, we have an emphasis on resilience, which starts with the Eurozone crisis. And to some extent, we see a lot of narratives that uh, kind of, in a way of an intertextual analysis, um, uh, connect with the previous narratives of the Commission. So we have the same um, emphasis on humanitarian assistance, disasters and arms conflict, and that's basically what resilience is all about. This is beginning of resilience uh, emergence as a Euro European Union discourse. As we are moving towards 2015, the Council will introduce slightly different, a slightly different perspective that is, I would say, is not present in the Commission of High Representative discourses. This is uh, security and defense. However, it's all, it is only related to terrorism, radicalization, security sector reform, and border management. Later on, the same uh, idea is reinforced by the emphasis on chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear related risks, but it will appeal much later in 2018. Uh, another specific, I would say, uh, uh, additional narrative is related to the energy security. It kind of intertwines with what has been mentioned by Giselle in, in the Commission's discourse. And finally, it is very clear for the Council, and here again, it reiterates this idea of joint ownership. Integrating resilience into national and local policies is primarily a responsibility of each country. And by each country, the uh, council means each state, right? So it's not very, very it's very clear that uh, civil society is implicitly excluded from the discourse. And um, we also have in parallel uh, with a, a turn in the European Union policy towards Belarus. So after 2016, when our um, European Union is more and more interested in, uh, in a rapprochement with Belarus, we have the Council conclusions, which will say that the Council welcomes uh, Belarus' constructive role in the region, opens up channels of communication, and energy and information security will, will very much fall in, line with, fall in line with this resilience approach. The European Parliament has a different, has always had a different perspective on resilience. It starts very much in line with Commission and uh, Council discourses with the um, emphasis on uh, security issues and uh, reforms and joint ownership as well. There is, however, always a special concern of emphasized human rights and conditionality. We have to say that this concern has only been reinforced with COVID-19 later on in 2020, but actually always present. However, it, if we look very closely at the discourse and uh, the way how the Parliament uh, started to actually move into the same 2016 shift towards Belarus. This is a partnership with, uh, with authorities and consultation with the civil society organization. And this, of course, um, makes uh, a completely different setting for the Belarusian civil society and non-state actors. So the second narrative of the, uh, of the European Parliament is, again, uh, least developed countries, state fragility, and very, very, very significantly, the, the resolution of 2017 will say the current EU approach is fundamentally valid. So there is no issue whatsoever. The Parliament does not identify the absence of authoritarian regimes as a problem. Um, basically says that fostering resilient, well-governed, prosperous, and aligned states as a neighborhood is, is a priority. We should, we should do that, but uh, remains relatively ambiguous in how and why it should be done. And what is also interesting is resilience is separate from the European Parliament engagement with Belarus. So there are some kind of, you know, a fragmentation of discourses. There is a stronger emphasis on human rights in the European Parliament discourse in Belarus, closer attention on political prisoners, labor rights, media freedoms. There are two, two Sakharov prices, we remember. And um, as it goes, However, there is a second, I would say, double track approach. There is a second discourse on resilience. So the parliament, although it actually does pay attention to the issue of uh, human rights and freedoms in Belarus, does not say no to resilience and the way it is being framed by the European Union Council and Commission. So we, uh, we set out to produce two order critique. The first other critique uh, goes through the five Vs uh, already mentioned by Dr. Giselle before. And we here uh, basically say, first other cr critique will focus on for whom and of what to what resilience is we are talking about. Uh, in terms of commission and the council, we, did, we clearly see that there is no distinction regarding the resume type as a critical point. And the European Parliament resolution it does introduce the same awareness about attacks on uh, civil activists that may represent a threat 
right? But they do not specifically highlight the fact that authoritarian regimes are very different, well, let's say from Georgia and Georgia or Moldova in the countries towards which we were probably, uh, you know, thinking where we would, would be reading the sentence. The key authority is definitely the state. And um, the European Union discourse prioritizes states' resilience over considerations of whatever state in question is being uh, dealt with. So is it democratic or authoritarian? It is uh, completely a secondary issue in the resilience discourse. In terms of what to what, we, ha we have a uh, expansion of sectors being covered under the resilience discourse from the Eurozone and humanitarian to development policies. There is also emphasis on agricultural sector and crisis management capacities. And we also see this idea, which we are going to reinforce in the secretary of the critique, uh, but, but, uh, but now we, we see the seed of this idea uh, being planted as a way of domestic sources of instability across sectors. So these domestic sources of instability are basically what we have to tackle when we talk about resilience. Seems logical, but as we will demonstrate in the second order critique, has a very important implication. And also to external pressures, but by external pressures, we don't see Russia as being, uh, you know, a very clearly an actor that becomes a uh, um, clearly identifiable object, which uh, basically messes with whole resilience approach. It's still, uh, you know, uh, critical infrastructure, potential energy security, hybrid threats, all of what, uh, in fact, Christian just mentioned when he was talking about uh, the very different approach to resilience, right? In any way, way, there is a silence to the context of non-democratic regimes, and this is something that we really wanted to highlight. In the first order critique, we also highlight the changing temporal scope, but the special unit, be it as it may, is always a state. The state and domestic sources for instability is something that is, is, is a reiterated idea that becomes very clearly articulated se several times, and when it becomes you know, very, very clearly articulated and if you want interpelled, it becomes sort of something that goes into European Union identity, as we've seen in the second order critique. And we have this shift uh, in terms of why, a shift towards a means of stabilizing the neighborhood, right? So resilience is a mechanism that European Union is choosing to stabilize its neighborhood. And um, uh, we have a sort of contradiction that we reinforce and highlight in the second order critique as well, because we have uh, hard security and stability on the one hand, uh, which is implicitly present in the resilience approach, but we also have a transformative values-based approach, right? So everything has to do with reforms, modernization, and democratization. And simultaneously, we have uh, European Union support that should be tailored to empower societies to identify and solve their own problems. So we have an inherent contradiction in the European Union uh, resilience building discourse, in which we as we already mentioned in the previous publications, we were trying to kind of sit on the fence and integrate part of the policies that European Union has been, you know, uh, designed, uh, has designed in, 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 uh, in the previous approaches. Right, it is particularly problematic because the communications do not distinguish regime types. And as a result, we were arguing the second order critique is basically what does what it leaves the room of maneuver to the authoritarian countries. So our second order critique and at the same time conclusions, we are already moving towards them, is that an attempt to project European Union liberal international identity as a soft power, which is different from approaches by United States or Russia. In the United States or Russia will never see resilience, right? We could not expect this to happen, but European Union you know, will. Uh, and this will distinguish uh, European Union from other actors, but at the same time, European Union kind of found a way to disguise its own tensions and contradictions as a global actor. And as it happens, uh, there is a legitimate goal or the leg legitimate move away from the goal of democratization towards an emphasis of building state resilience of states. We will, we will try to say societies, but it's mostly states. Right, the key role of states and the principle of pragmatism already very much very well highlighted by my co-author Dr. Cecilia Boss in her previous publication. So, are we promoting values? Are we promoting principles? Are we promoting security? So, um, uh, there is this principle of pragmatism, which can be, in fact, without any kind of problems, promoted uh, under the you know uh, this uh, umbrella of uh, resilience. You can do it towards democratic countries. You can do it towards non-democratic countries. You would argue it's maybe the magic of resilience, but we say that this magic is highly problematic. Because 
we kind of forgot this, uh, that we promote resilience building policies in uh, towards something which happens in a formal political space, but also in a social space. Right. So resilience discourse kind of neglects completely the fact that we are also operating in the social space. We highlight the state. We de-emphasize the role of non-state actors and civil society actors. And that's crucially important to the construct of authoritarian regimes. Think about a large state process in Belarus. Think also about this territorial denial, if you wish, that has been provided via guerrilla actors, those people that basically explode a railway in Belarus. Uh, and pre prevent from Russian, uh, you know, uh, supplies move through the territory of Belarus, and that I think is only going to increase. So that's a socially, um, you know, a, so a social act. It's not exactly a political act of, of the state. And by highlighting uh, a state as a key uh, inter, uh, you know, counterpart of European Union towards resilience building, we have probably omitted this already in the previous approach. So very quickly now conclusions, so authoritarian regimes do not, are not explicitly addressed in the European Union in, in resilience discourse, but there is a very strong resilience the discourse as we all know, and that is very problematic. So the Commission, Council and High Representative have elaborated this state-centric and pragmatic vision of resilience, which prioritizes state's resilience or considerations of whatever state in question is democratic or authoritarian. There are several phases of resilience, of course, resilience for the EU by means of the Belarusian state, right? So we talked about this energy resilience before, and we know that it can feed into a more secure European Union. Resilience of Belarusian state and by means of the Belarusian state, right? And we uh, can say that is something where we basically empowered the state through its support, through several ministries already mentioned by Dr. Gisela Balsa before. And there are also silences, and the silence are not innocent, they create implications. And this, there is a resilience of independent civil society or society at large. And that all makes the resilience discourse very unhelpful and very problematic to the extent it's, it leaves a huge room of maneuver for the authoritarian governments. And I will end my uh, part of the presentation here, uh, pass over to, to our chair, double-headed chair. <laughs> and thank you very much for the attention. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Alena. I think we're still very much on time, which is uh, always uh, difficult to manage if you are chairing and uh, presenting at the same time. Uh, but I now pass on the floor uh, to Domenico for the last paper presentation in this panel. Thank you very much. I think everyone can see the screen hopefully. Yes, great. Um, I shall give perhaps some brief background about this paper, which was, as all the others, conceived, uh, reviewed and published before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, this is part of my uh, PhD project in which I analyze the use of cultural diplomacy by the European Union and Russia in uh, uh, Eastern Europe and the South Caucasus. Um, and uh, I will move to the background. Let's see if I'm able to. Uh, do you see the slide moving? Yes, but perhaps you could put it still on ah, presentation yeah. mode. Oh, let's see. I'm trying now. Yes, okay. Does it work? We still no. see the slide. Hmm. Oh. oh, yeah, because but now it's, it's yeah, it's on uh, it's on full screen in my screen, but I don't know for for which reason it isn't. But we now see the background slide, so okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. Um so um this is a story that somehow has already been discussed during this uh, this panel we have seen a change with the framing of a contested word in the 2016 global strategy the geopolitical aspirations which have been emphasized with the geopolitical commission in 2009 and 19 and then we had this uh as men uh, Borel mentioned the belated birth of a geopolitical Europe. The focus when we talk about this uh, uh, U-turn to geopolitics is always on, uh, you know, stick and carrot policies that would allow an actor to stay in this geopolitical course. 
uh, in my paper, I tend to do I attempted to do something different. So uh, there is this culturalization of international politics, as mentioned by this uh, by Rose. So I wanted to understand how actually this um, uh, EU uh, cultural and external relations, so EU international cultural relations, are affected by this uh, turn. And in my paper, I look at the discursive articulation. So the narrative the EU advances uh, for its cultural relations with Eastern Partnership uh, countries. Uh, moving to my theoretical framework, um, I use a post-structuralist uh, post-structuralist approach is mainly uh, based on uh, Lenehan's and seminal work, highlighting this co-constitutive connection between uh, uh, identity and foreign policy. So the idea is that foreign policy reliable representations of identity, but it's also when uh, formulating, implementing foreign policy that the identities are reproduced. I look at how self and others are represented within uh, the discourse. Uh, and my focus yes, in post-structuralist fashion is to understand a bit how the discourse produce meanings and uh, relations of power. Uh, I will move to uh, the methodology. My, uh, my methodology is I use uh, oh. discourse analysis. Domenico, I'm yes. so sorry, but we don't see your slides uh, turn. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> um, yeah, now we see methodology. Ah, okay, so I will stick here. Okay, let's. Okay, so yes, um, uh, the previous slide was on the theoretical framework, so uh, discussing a bit how I see the connection, the co-constitutiveness between identity and uh, foreign policy. And my methodology uh, is based on, uh, uh, well, my objective is to examine the official discourse of the EU, in particular culture and external relations with emphasis on Eastern partnership countries in a 13 year temporal development. And I refer to 2007 because the, the very first document presenting, discussing culture and external relations dates back to 2007 with the uh, European Agenda on Culture in a Globalizing uh, World. Uh, my textual selection includes, of course, the policy documents from uh, the EU institution dealing with foreign and neighborhood policy, and also this uh, unique network, this network of uh, that includes um, member states, uh, foreign ministries, and national institutes of culture that was created in 2005 and now has also an administrative arrangement with the EAS. So it's, a, let's say, an important actor considering also that culture remains uh, a supporting competence. Uh, policymakers' declarations that are relevant. And this is also complemented by seven semi-structured interviews that I conducted with EU officials, EU cultural operators, so cultural operators that implement projects that are EU funded and cultural operators that are um, do not belong to this uh, category, let's say. I use, again, uh, uh, unseen similar work in which uh, text with formal authority are given uh, epistemological and methodological priority. And the objective is to understand by analyzing this text what are the most prominent discursive articulations that allow me to depict this ideal type construction of the you self and the others. Um, in my, uh, I will move now to the empirical part and particularly to this free discursive articulations, and I will try to uh, to also give some examples what this entails in practice. Uh, the first one is. Yeah, I would say we are not reinventing something new. It's uh, it's a narrative that has already been there for quite a while, and which seeks to be somehow in between. On the one hand, emphasizing the celebration of differences, and on the other, recognizing that some of these differences, in the end, uh, define a European soul. Um, uh, what I argue, and this is together also with other scholars that have examined this issue, is that the nodal point around which this articulation is created is actually not diversity, but rather uh, united of unity. The overall idea is that it was the EU that was able to bring countries together after centuries of divi divisions. 
Uh, the EU has been referenced on this as a cultural superpower. This is an expression that was used by Federica Mogherini in, uh, I think, two or three occasions, which sparked considerable uh, debate. And in this, cultural diplomacy is considered the preferred vehicle to do window dressing activities. Uh, where do EAP countries stand there? Uh, on the one hand, there is an attempt to portray these countries as part of the European family. At the, other, uh, at the other side of the spectrum, in some cases, the EU, as the EU appropriates Europe, it presents this country as a space in, uh, in between. Uh, and of course, when it comes to Russia, this uh, from temporal, from the temporal laddering that was very much used also in the past in this narrative to, uh, for instance, the fact that it was thanks to the EU that countries that were divided were able to, to be together. Uh, now we see a tendency to move towards a uh, geographical laddering. An example of what this discursive articulation entail is um, this event. It was organized. This also I draw on my uh, on my fieldwork, on my most recent fieldwork in Armenia. And this is the European Day of Languages. This is a typical event that is organized by you delegations in the world, in which the objective is to say, let's say, uh, bring together the different the different languages and come up with a uh, with a unified uh, message about showcasing again the diversity of uh, of culture. Uh, I will move to the second narrative, which I think which I think connects very much with what we have been uh, uh, discussing, because I see in this new narrative, the narrative of co-creation, of mutuality and reciprocity, this attempt to this being part of a broader trend that we have seen, for instance, in the 2015 EMP review, talking about local ownership, seek to increasing the focus on the local and to challenge a bit this EU-centrism. Uh, the interesting element here is that EU cultural uh, relations, and now I'm using another word, required also a new vocabulary. So moving away from cultural diplomacy, which is often perceived as one side, to cultural relations. This is, of course, a contested switch because culture, when we talk about cultural relations in uh, IR and also beyond IR, we are not focusing on the state, we're focusing on cultural relations as a whole. And there are a number of issues on this. The first element is that there is already a mismatch between uh, the first narrative and the second narrative. Can uh, the EU, what I ask in my paper, self-praise um, in the world and at the same time promote co-creation? The second element is that, okay, you can promote co-creation, mutuality, reciprocity, but the policy I have in mind, which draws on my fieldwork, is Armenia, where there are different security considerations there. So uh, there is a bit of a, of a mismatch between what the EU is actually doing uh, for any legitimate reason uh, there, and the fact that other countries may have different perceptions on uh, your action uh, on the ground. And so there is also a need to take this into account when adjusting uh, your external action, because some actors may have very different understandings of priorities and securities. And this has to be, I think, uh, taken into account, especially in the case of Armenia, we're talking about a very close, uh, still a very close neighbor. Thank you, Domenico. Thank you so much. Um, then also I see in the chat uh, by Tatiana uh, Shaban, of course, also a colleague of ours, um, a very important comment also on missed opportunities in EU relations with Belarus. I'm looking at Alena as well. I think I would fully agree with this moment of missed opportunity. So thank you again also for, for that contribution still. Um, and then I would say, uh, as there are no more immediate uh, interventions from the audience, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, uh, to our panelists um, uh, this afternoon, uh, Alena, uh, uh, Christian and Domenico. So thank you that you took time in your very, very busy schedules. Uh, Christian um, also being in two places at the same time, uh, but doing so very successfully. So thank you so much um, for joining us. Uh, and also a very big thank you to our audience. 
uh, who engaged also very actively uh, this morning and um, perhaps a bit more modestly, but still I would assume very actively this afternoon. And a very big thank you um, uh, to uh, Felix and Melissa at Campus Brussels, who I don't know how they managed, but uh, I think this week there's um, three or four workshops coinciding and they somehow managed to keep them all apart and still give all of them, uh, each of them, um, more than 150% attention, including uh, changing programs, um, changing names, uh, ch <laughs> uh, changing presenters uh, until the very last minute. So uh, thank you so much uh, for all your help. Um, I think we all felt uh, very well supported um, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, very grateful um, that, that you helped us uh, to make this workshop uh, possible. So on that note, uh, please uh, make sure uh, to follow up on the uh, special issue publication. Um, it will be, uh, let me just see that I get this uh, uh, correctly, it will be, uh, or it is already, the publications are in the uh, Journal of Contemporary European Studies, uh, so please visit the site and have a look, you will find most of the articles uh, back there, um, and uh, Alena and my article uh, will be published uh, very, very soon, <laughs> so um, uh, that should be found there also um, within a, a month or two. So thank you so much everyone, and uh, we hope um, that uh, this was also interesting uh, for those of you in the audience, wherever you may have followed us from.